Jay Shramath Ji, Felicity. Um, it's very nice to have you um, this morning on the 1st of December 2023 uh, to uh, share your lovely memories with Sri Adi Shakti Shramath Ji herself. Uh, it's been an amazing morning. Uh, it's 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 been frosty, very, very heavy frost. Then it snowed, didn't settle on the ground and the sun shining now. So we've had all weather. It's really quite special. Um, oh. Would you please <laughs> start with um, sharing your journey of seeking and and how it brought you to Sri Mataji, please? So I would... I was thinking about this and I would say it really my consciousness of seeking God was when I was 14. I just suddenly seemed to sort of wake up in the world and become aware of the bigger world around me and this sense inside. I remember feeling this joyful feeling that, oh, life is what you make of it. I can make this a good life. And that lasted for a little bit. And then a whole bunch of sort of family stuff came in. We had illnesses, breakdowns, um, fires, <laughs> all kinds of things, which I think were just to distract me in a way. But through all of that, there was always this, um, I just felt somehow, I, you know, we didn't go to church. My father was a very, was a very Dharmic man. And when I was 13, we stopped going to church because... We had a new canon and he felt that he was just interested in social stuff, that he didn't have the depth. And so we stopped going. But somehow, you know, I had that feeling inside me. There, There is God and I wanted to find him. I wanted to find him. And I had a difficult time all through um, the last part of my teenage years. And then I went... Uh, I went to university and I was 19 and I remember arriving in university and settling in and just suddenly feeling like, what am I doing here? You know, this, this isn't what my life is about. Um, I want to be with God. I want to find God. And I remember feeling very sort of desperate. And I, I had a happened to have a copy of the Bible. I grabbed the Bible. And I thought, oh, I'll look through here. You know, you're looking for some, some answers, something. And I'm looking through my mind going, no, no, there's nothing here. And I put it down, you know, and I just had such a sort of, you know, desperate feeling. And then I heard this voice. I felt this voice. And it's, you know, over the years now, 40 years later, I would say, I can recognize, you can feel when it's the voice of God, when it's Shumataji, yeah. it resonates through you. It's like, it blocks everything else out. And there's just this voice. And this voice said to me, when the time is right, I will come for you. And I just was comforted. I had to feel comforted. And I went, okay, I just have to keep doing what I'm doing, you know. So I finished university. I got my degree. It wasn't easy. I really worked too hard and felt I'd lost the joy. And I finished university and I said, okay, I've done everything my parents wanted. You know, I've got the degree, I've done that. Now my life is for myself and I'm going off to find my the joy that I've lost. And so I booked a ticket and I went with a small um, a travel group that were traveling across from Turkey to, to India. And my goal was to go to Australia where my mother was from. And I would visit all these countries on the way, you know, I just was off. And then I got to, I had very interesting experiences. It was quite quick traveling through um, Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, and I got to India and it was like a totally different place. So I'd been through all these Muslim countries and suddenly there I was in India, predominantly a Hindu country, even though I came through the north, I started in Am Amritsar, uh, came down through um, Hardwa on the Ganges. And mm -hmm. I was just like blown away by the color, the vitality. Everyone lived close together. Nobody minded the noise, you know. And I just went, what is this country? Because... You have to understand in those days, so this was 1979. I'm traveling in 1979 in November. 
and there was Suppose no the summer then uh no I left I worked through the summer I left co university and I got a job at the airport for three months saved enough money so I could go traveling right. and uh, I left September went to Greece got to Turkey in October pretty well and then went uh, took about a month through those countries uh, to get to India. But so there was no, um, there was just TV and radio and newspapers. And that was, you were very limited by what they presented. So my vision I realized of India when I got there was a famine and drought, you know, because <laughs> that's all the pictures that we saw at right. the time. So this is why yeah. it was such a kind of... Yeah, that's what media projection, yes. Yeah, you know, no internet, nothing. So, you know, what you have in your world. So it was really eye-opening for me. And to travel through those Muslim countries as well, to be um, exposed to the different religions. And when I got to India, I felt that the Hindu religion actually had the deeper understanding. You know, they were very tolerant of all religions. And, and that's what I felt by the time I got to India, I realized that actually in their depths, all the religions were the same. It was all about being with God, you know, devotion and having that, there was this oneness that went through underneath all yeah. the religions. And anyway, so then I traveled down through, in, so I decided, uh, so I had a boat ticket from Madras to um, Jakarta, then, a to then to sing Singapore, Penang, and then I had a flight to Sydney. And I counted up all my money and I said, um, I'm gonna stay in this country as long as my la money lasts. So I had a hundred pounds, which went a long way in those days. Like, you oh, know, it was days, like yes. a couple of rupees bought you a, a full meal. And yeah, the, most, the most expensive thing was, was travel. Um, so anyway, mm. I spent about five months. It was, yeah, it was about five, five and a half months. And I would travel from the north down the west coast. So I arrived in November, December, and it was too cold to go up north. So I had to go south first. So I decided to come down the, the western coast and I came down to uh, Kerala. And I was staying in. And on the way, every so often, I'd have this really strong desire inside to... I'd see someone on a train traveling and there were a lot of young Westerners. Um, I wasn't a hippie, I wasn't on the hippie trail, but there were a lot of hippies and there mm. were, I discovered yeah. quite a lot of false gurus in India at that time. And every so often I would meet someone who'd been to one of them. Like I met a fellow who'd been to Rajneesh, I met someone who'd been to the, the false Sai Baba. And I, I asked about three or four people at different times prompted by this inner, ask them. And I'd ask, have you been anywhere? Have I was sort of looking for a yogi in the mountain, you know? Have you been anywhere? Have you seen anything? Yes. I, no, it was just inside was just asking and each time they would say oh yes I went to so and so don't go there he's just there for people's money or he's just preying on you know young yeah. people and it was like okay okay you know this is all new to me and then anyway, after about five months I ended up in the wildlife sanctuary Periyar in um, the uh, yeah in this wildlife sanctuary it was beautiful and the second or third night, I just suddenly felt, I I don't know, this seeking came up in me again. And a friend on my travels had given me a copy of the Upanishads, this beautiful Vedic, oh. it's part of the Vedas, and literally it's poems of being one with the divine. It's just all about the beauty of God. And, and I just, so I just opened this book and I started reading and I just went, ah. Oh, this is what I want. I want this, you know? So the next day I left, I moved into a different hotel. And in that hotel were two young Australians, young men. I saw them walking up and down the corridor. And again, this desire came over me. Ask them, have you been anywhere? Have you seen anyone? And I'm going, no, no, I don't want to ask them. I don't know them, you know? I was really, there was some really reluctance. And finally, I couldn't, help it you know and I asked one of them and I said have you been anywhere oh yes he said we just met this lady a few weeks back she was giving a public program and I felt all these things on my hands and he 
said, it's kind oh. of gone off a bit for me, but my friend had a very deep experience. He won't really talk about it much because it touched him so deep. So I didn't know anything, you know, but he gave me a copy of Sad Yoga, The Unique Discovery. So this was right. the standard um, leaflet. It was about this size. It was quite big, A4, A, A4. A3. Yeah, it was bigger than the letter size, you know, or maybe it was it yeah, anyway. Um, so it had the black and white picture of mother at the top, the standard one that we use. And then um, and then it had a lot of information. So I took it with me and I into my room and I went to sleep. And that night I had insomnia. And that was a problem that I had at that time. I had um, recurrent insomnia and eating problems. I just knew it as I had these eating problems. I'd lost a lot of weight. And um, in the leaflet, it said mother could cure anything. And I thought, if she could fix my sleeping and my eating problems, I could feel my life would be back on track. I would be more, I would just be going where I was supposed to be going because these, the sleeping, everything was so distracting. You know, your attention had to keep going onto your physical being and not just on the joy of living. Yeah. So it said it had a little address um, that I so I wrote to her and I said I'm down in the south I'd like to meet Shumataji you know how can I do this and I put a post box in Bombay so I'm on my way back up I travel back up and I'd arranged to meet a friend in Delhi so funny these little things how yeah. all these little things come together and I get to Mumbai and there, open my post, but there is a letter. Someone wrote back to me. I don't know who it was, bless them, and said, Shramadachi is at the, coming to the end of her tour. Uh, she's been here. She, I discovered later she'd been there since January for three months doing a tour. She'll be back in Delhi for the last week of programs. And it was the exact dates that I had arranged to meet my friend. So I thought, good, okay, this is all lining up. And so off I go. No, not off I go, <laughs> because the day before, the day before I was to get on the train ticket to go to Delhi, I suddenly started to get like this, this, I can't describe it anything other than a fight going on in my brain of to whether I should go take that train the next day or, oh, you could wait another day and do more sightseeing and go the next day. And, and it just was like two people arguing in my head and whatever I decided, and got like 10 seconds of quiet. Then the other one would start again. No, 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 you should do this, you know. And it went on all afternoon till I couldn't bear it any longer. And I flushed the ticket down the toilet. I go, okay, that's it. That's the end of that conversation. You know, I'll get another ticket tomorrow and go the following day. So the next day I spent all day lining up for a new ticket. Didn't get to do any sightseeing, nothing. Yes. And off I go on the train, halfway on the way to Delhi, we pass a train wreck and I realized, oh my God, that's the train I was supposed to be on. And I just thought, and then I thought, somebody's looking after me. I should have been on that train. So on my way, I go and I arrive in Delhi on holy day. I didn't know what this was. I come off the train and I start walking through the streets to get to my hotel. And the streets are deserted. So I've been in India for five months. I know that in India, there's people everywhere. Yes. And there's people giggling up in their windows. And I see paint splodges all across along the road I'm walking on. <laughs> and then somebody laughs from up top and says to me, you know, you should get off the streets. Like I realized later, yeah. you're a target. But not, nobody did anything. There was a lot of respect in those days for English people, for Westerners. There weren't so many there weren't so many you know touring around and anyway I found the Indians the whole of my time there nothing but gracious respectful courteous I did mean hospitable I did meet one or two people that I had my doubts about but in general I you know I was pretty protected and protected by other Indians I think some of them were quite shocked that I was I was 22 at this point a young That's West good, yeah. I mean, somebody even said to me, how how does your father let you travel alone, you know? Yes. And I had to explain to people that we all, weren't all promiscuous and debauched in the West, you know, because <laughs> that's all they saw on the TV. Yes. So anyway, I 
settled into my hotel and I found the address. It, they'd given me an address where mother was going to be and I thought, I'll go next day. So next day, off I toddle. Um, I must have got a rickshaw. I got a rickshaw to take me to this address. And I'm, I keep getting it mixed up, but I think this was the Tenna Shocker Road in Delhi. And I arrive at the gate because it's a little bungalow. Um, I mean, maybe not so little, but a bungalow set back within a bit of land. And yes. at the back of the land, they'd set up a pendle, which was where they were having public programs. And Gregoire met me, bless him. And, you know, oh, OK, yes, come in, welcome me in. Um, I think said, uh, so, you know, Shumadachi will have tea in a little while. Shumadachi will come out. And, you know, I just remember sort of hanging, hanging around and I, people didn't pay me much notice. And then Shumadachi came out and we had tea. Yeah. And I have to say, at that point, my chakras, yeah, this was 79. I'd been through such a lot in my life. My chakras were very blocked yeah. and I just did not... It was like, I would say life was was in monochrome for me to some extent. And Shumadaji, I just saw her. She was part of that. I think she tried to talk to me a little bit. But I can imagine, you know, when I've seen later people coming in who are quite damaged in some ways. And you can see they're not connecting. So you just sort of yeah. leave them be. And then they said, we're having a program in the evening. And I must have gone away and come back and gone into the tent. And it was full of mature people, like Indian businessmen, like my dad. There was only one other new Western person and then a half a dozen or so. Um, I think there was 12 yogis traveling with mother on this tour. This is, so this is 79, spring 79. So and I sat at the back and Shumadaji talked in Hindi. So I had no idea what was going on and then Two ladies came and worked on me. I think it was Marie and Mandy. And I just couldn't stop thinking. I didn't know you weren't even supposed to stop thinking. You know? And I nothing <laughs> happened. I didn't get anything. And they said right. to me, you, you're, you're thinking, you know, come back tomorrow night. But I saw other Indians, like middle class, you know, Indian people, suddenly after their realize exper realization experience going like, ah. Oh, and rushing up to bow at mother's feet. So I thought, what's going on here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I came back the next night and having been forewarned, I really tried not to think. Again, mother spoke in Hindi the whole time, but then they came and worked on me again. And this time I felt like something go up my left side, like just a sh flash. But they right. said to me, you've got it, you've got it. I go up and meet Shumataji. So I went up and I knelt in front of her and she said, good, good, very good. She said, are you vegetarian? <laughs> Obviously picking up on my Nabi problem. And I said, no, no, I'm not vegetarian. And then, um, and then that was sort of it. And then I got my rickshaw, went back to my hotel and I went to have my dinner. And suddenly I realized I'm sitting eating my food and there is no thought in my head about what I'm eating and nothing. Usually I had like, oh, should you eat this? No, you shouldn't eat this. If you eat that, you're going to get fatter. It was just like this constant conversation around food. And I went, wow, I would enjoy living life like this. <laughs> I would enjoy living life like this, you know? And then I went to bed yeah. and slept so deeply like a log. And wow. I woke up, I thought I'd been asleep for 14 hours, but it, it wasn't that long. And so then I I thought, whoa, there's something here. So see how mother picked up on the things that were bothering me. And she goes, okay, I'm hooking you in. You know, this is your yeah. hook. Yes. So I went So I went back the next night. And, and also, as I was going to the program that night, I got a rickshaw. And I felt like he was trying to charge me too much. And I got mm -hmm. cross with him. And suddenly I realized that this nice mood that I'd been feeling, which I hadn't been aware of, had gone. You know, obviously my Kundalini dropped down. And I went, oh, what was that? That was nice, you know? So anyway, so I went to the program and it must have been near the beginning of that week of programs. And what I noticed, actually I felt that when I first arrived at 
the bungalow. I remember now I saw these other Westerners and I'd been traveling for five months with lots of other Western young hippie people. And for the first time I saw them and I felt these are people like me. I felt a connection inside. I, you know, it was a, a deeper connection on a deeper level, nothing to do with what they looked like, what they wore, nothing. It was just like, ah, oh, these are people like me, you know? And because you don't understand anything, when you first come into Saudi Yoga, certainly in those days, you don't understand what this is, what mother is offering you. What I felt was, I really liked how I felt. I liked the people. I felt there's something deeper. I could feel inside me something saying, go back, go back. But I couldn't physically manage to attend every program. So I, I could feel it was too much for me vibrationally. I, I couldn't put it into words, but I could just feel that. So I said to myself, just go every second night. So I would, I would, and literally I would have the day off waiting for the next day to go to the program. You know, I don't remember doing sightseeing or anything. I was just waiting. And so then I went back. And towards the end of the week, Douglas, bless him, said to me, we're going to Bordy for a seminar. Would you like to come? So, oh, I forgot to say, I got to Delhi and discovered a letter from my friend saying he couldn't come. So I was completely free. <laughs> no okay. obligations. I thought, well, that was later. I thought that was a trick to get me up to Delhi, you know, make sure I would be there. And I also discovered yes. that I was traveling in. So I was actually traveling all around India during the time mother was there. You know, she was there from January okay. to mid-March and so was I, you know. So I just feel in hindsight that, um, and I was in Kerala when she gave that public program, you know. So in right. my, I, I know that on the one hand, we are all nothing, but mother has shown us how each one of us is special and is taken care of. And I felt in hindsight, I just, that was no coincidence, you know, that I was there then. Absolutely. And so then I traveled on the train down to Bordy. And um, so it, there was very few, there were, as I said, about 12 of the Western yogis. And so this I, is, um... This must be the India tour, the first, very first India tour, which Pat, Maureen, Douglas, and other no, yogis. No, I think they were on one in 78, because Pat and Maureen weren't on this ah, tour. Yes, they were on the, the 70. This is the, the 79. Yeah, this is the spring 79 one. And so no um, no buses, no official tours, as I said, about half a, about 12. Western yogis, everyone traveling on the train with Shramataji. Um, and I remember feeling that surprise that she didn't, she, you know, like I had the sense from people who talked to me about the other false gurus that they were all up in their ivory towers. If they deigned to speak with you, you were lucky sort of thing. And you didn't have that feeling. Shramataji was traveling with everyone. She yeah. was very much in, not control, but you know, her presence was very much felt and she was the person around which everything was revolving, but she didn't um, trade on that in any way. You know, mm -hmm. we were all um, respected and you all had a, you know, part in her attention. So I'll skip, uh, uh, you know, I'll skip ahead a little oh. bit. So we're in Bordy um, and I think there were about 30 people. I don't think all the Westerners came. And that was it, you know, a seminar for about 30 people. And I remember we had this foot soak in the ocean. So, so I, at this point, I still didn't know what this was all about because Shamadashi had only spoken in Hindi. I, you know, I think they, the yogis might have said a few things, but I didn't have a clue, you know. Um, I knew you were supposed to feel something. I didn't feel anything, you know, they'd said, do you feel cool? Do you, you know, no, nada. <laughs> but <laughs> something inside is telling me, stick with this. Yeah. So we're in this little kind of um, seaside hut, but it's bigger than that, you know, near the water. And Shumadiji's on her chair in the middle of the room and she gets all the yogis to stand up and form this horseshoe bandhan with the person on the left with their hand towards her and then all the rest of us were connected we were actually touching you know so you put your hand out the person 
on this side puts their fingers into the susrara, into the like, yes, exactly like that. And then so your left hand is being connected to the person on your right and your right hand is going into the susrara of the left hand person next to you. So we're all in this lovely bundle and the person right on the end on the right hand side has their hand out towards the air, you know, away from Shamanji. So we're standing like this. And then mother says, are you all feeling cool breeze in both hands? And then I realized I'm feeling cool in my right hand for the first time. Wow, I'm feeling cool vibrations, but nothing in the left. So I said, I'm not feeling anything in the left and dramatically. And she said, come, come forward. And I went up and I knelt in front of her. She seemed very big. I have this memory. I can see her just kind of looming in front of me. And she said, put your hands out and ask, mother, is this the cool breeze of the Holy Ghost? Is this the cool breeze of the Param Chaitanya? And I asked out loud. And I felt this just rush of something just rushed up and this weight literally fell off my shoulders. It was just like coming out into the sunshine. And I could feel this cool wind just blowing it into me from her. And I was just like, wow. And it was transforma transformative. Yeah. And suddenly I felt like, I mean, obviously she just completely, my left side had been completely blocked. She just opened it up. And I felt like I got my soul back again. I felt like I could write poetry, all the joy, all the joy came yes, back. Yes, the joy you were seeking, yes. Um, my liver was very bad, so my attention, you know, couldn't sort of settle. I couldn't settle into like the silence, but I just felt totally different. And I went, oh, wow. And then after, in the afternoon, we sat around her and she spoke in English for the first oh. time. And she gave this talk and I listened to it recently. And what I remembered from that time was that in that talk, she said, and do you think Christ was some skinny namby pamby sort of fellow? And something inside me went, click, it's okay not to be thin, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and when I look back at that talk, that talk, so much of it is around eating and food and being balanced. And I, I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, of course there were other, lots of other people it must've been meant for, but it was so tailored to what I needed to hear. But when she opened her mouth and she started to speak in English, and because I guess finally I'd really got my realization, I just felt for the first time in, not exactly the first time in my life, but I suddenly felt here is somebody who is speaking but believes everything that I believe is important, that I value inside in my life. I couldn't have put it into words or articulated yeah. if you'd asked me, but suddenly I felt that connection. You know, it was just so, so deep because we had, we had been living in a wasteland, I would say, you know, the times in the 70s and growing up, it was like this barren wasteland of spirituality. And, yeah. and I'd met, a, I'd met four people, three people at university that I connected with on a deeper level who were also seeking, I realized later, but mm -hmm. you know, there was mother in person. So it, it was just, I felt and I felt that mother is putting a straw down, that I'm drowning, I've been drowning, and she's putting a straw down to me. And if I hold on to this straw, she'll, she's, everything's going to be all right. She'll, you know, I felt that. And so I still was just, the seminar went on. I, I remember at one point just bursting into tears uncontrollably. I think your left side opens and just all the pain and the suffering that you've had stored inside you. You know, Shumaraji has said, everything we've been through is stored in our chakras, not just yeah. this life. 
that previous and all this just came out and I couldn't <laughs> stop crying and they so they were obviously somebody told her manager and they she called me and she said no 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 it's okay that you have to stop stop crying because you know it doesn't make <laughs> you feel good when you cry too much and anyway so I was with them and Douglas I have to say Douglas took care of me he gave me a photo which we'll look at later black and white photo my first one I had for such a long time and he told me, you know, you can put your hands to this. And I felt cool breeze. I felt cool, you know, cool breeze coming out of this photo. And so it was just this complete package of people I could relate to, this whole change in my being. And I just knew, you know, I just want to be here. I want to be with Shumadachi. I, I need to be here. And so she was winding up the tour. We went back to Mumbai. I think actually, so I thought we had a puja after the seminar, but when I went back and looked through the dates in Amruta, I see that actually the puja, mother had a birthday puja just before we went to Bodhi. And I was invited wow. to that. Can you imagine? I was invited to that. And I'd only had realization like five days before. And Shumataji, bless her, we were in a much bigger room um, with lots of Indians and you know, I would say there was probably maybe 40, 50 people there. And mother said, you know, oh, and she beckoned to me to come forward. Later, I realized, you know, she always called new people to do, um, to do the, to come up and wash her feet, to, you know, clear you. And as I moved forward and got close, and then she went, no, 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 it's okay, <laughs> go back. And I think I sort of remember, I think the vibrations were just would have been way too much for me to handle. And it was yes. just like, okay it's okay you know she was so sweet it was very and I felt um and I just I, I basically joined the tour you know and I stayed with them at this point once we we went down to Mumbai I'd, I stayed with them mother was staying I think in Raja Shah's flat and um yeah I was just like hanging out you know and then we came back to Delhi and um Shumadaji was, we were at the train. And so I had decided, I think someone must have asked me what I was going to do. And I said, I'm coming. Oh, mother said to me in Bodhi, she said, you'd better come back to London. And there were so only- So was Rao in Bodhi as well? Um, she must have been, but I don't have, I have, um, I only remember certain faces, you know. Sure. She must yes. have been. And the one that I remembered, uh, that was the other thing that struck me. I was very impressed by the purity and the love of the Indian Sajogis. And I remember thinking, if they've got this through Sajoga, this is what I want. I want to feel like that. I want to be that kind of person. And then mother said to me, you better come back to London. Because at that time, there were literally only yogis in London and in Delhi and Mumbai, you know, that was it. Um, when I got back to London, I discovered there was Marie in France and Gregoire, I'm not sure where he was at that time, but but that was it. So I cashed, so I arranged to, I would stay after mother had left and I would cash in my boat ticket, my plane ticket, which just came to enough to get a plane ticket back to London, which I had vowed I'd left. I said, I'm never coming back to London again. I'm a city, not a city person. And I thought to myself, if I can learn to live in London through Sajoga, then I can learn to live anywhere. You know, you get these sort of flashes of wisdom <laughs> yeah. come in. Yeah. And so we're standing on the station. Mother's getting the train, I guess, to the airport or something. It was very, you know, everything was very grassroots in those days. Nothing was you know, specially organized. Everyone was completely respectful and, you know, their behavior towards Shumataji, especially in India was impeccable. But it was still, you know, she was, she traveled like one of us. Yes. Um, and so we're standing on the platform and suddenly I'm thinking, you know, mother's going, where am I going to stay? And I had seen this, the, the coordinator leader of Delhi, Mr. Subramanian, was such a beautiful person, such a big heart. And in my, in my 
head came this thought oh I wish I could stay with them I felt like I would be safe you know would yes. be a nurturing environment and suddenly Shumataji turns to him and says she should stay with you and <laughs> while wow, she's organizing to come to London and I just went oh you know I mean that that was my first one early example of how mother can read your thoughts. <laughs> she knows exactly what you're thinking, how, and you don't have to be next to her. You don't have to be close to her. She has this all encompassing attention, which just, you know, her, her attention was, I mean, what words can we have to explain that? How she, you know, yeah. she knew everything. So that was it. So then I stayed with them. It was Ooh. lovely. And I hopped on a plane okay, and I that's... yeah. So okay. um I... did you want me to mention the the the, the palmist? I want yes, I was thinking where where did you meet the astrologer? Where did he, because where did he fit in? I mean yes. as a I forgot that. So on my travels when in... when was that? <laughs> So I would say that was yeah. about halfway through. I was down because I gradually came in from the north and just moved down south. I went, you know, Delhi, uh, Rajasthan, um, Goa, you know, down the coast. Mm. Bang Bangalore was a small country town, not the Silicon Valley it is today. And it was, so, no. it was I, I'm very blessed that I got to see traditional India how every state was different. It had its yeah. own language, its own food, its own marriage customs. Um, I, I visited a couple, its own culture, its own history. You know, every state was like a little country, its own language. It was just amazing. And yeah. uh, so I'm down, I was either in Karnataka, it was near, I can't remember, I'd have to look on the map, but it was a little hill station up in like with the tea plantations all around. So I'm down south and I'm staying in a little hotel and this young manager, Indy, young Indy manager came to me one morning and said, we have a resident palmist. So we're, it's not commercial. There's nothing commercial about it. Where I traveled hardly seeing any Westerners at all. I was just, you know, doing local. You weren't on the tourist tra trail, really. I was not. Were... I absolutely was yeah. not, you know. And occasionally I would meet some, you know, have a chat, talk. But I was just like wandering around India, you know, clear enjoying just having time out cleansing I realize now so there I am up in the mountain this beautiful place and he said to me we have an Indian palm he said we have a resident palm a, a resident who is a palmist and who reads people's hands and he so if this Indian palmist asked the manager he said I've never read a white person's hand I would like to could you ask her and so he <laughs> said to me, would you mind? Could he have a look at your hand? And I thought, why not? You know? <laughs> so I'm sitting at the table. Yeah. I'm sitting at the dining table in the dining room. I'm with my hand out. He's holding my hand. He has a little book beside him that he's consulting. He's looking at my hand. He's looking at the book, you know. So I'm sitting there and no conversation is going on. And I thought, well, I should take advantage of this. I should ask him some big questions, you know. So the hotel manager was then translated and I said, um, so I, you know, who will I marry? And he said, oh, you'll marry someone from a different country, which I I felt from a teenager that's what would happen. And then I said, how many children will I have? And he said, five. He, said, he looked at my hand and he went, I see five children. And I went, five and I said how many boys and girls I mean I'd always wanted to have a, you know having had a somewhat dysfunctional family I had this desire to have a very you know loving family um, and I saw having quite a few children but I hadn't thought of five I must say. <laughs> and he said five and I said how many boys and girls and he said mm, I see three boys but I can't see more and then then um, then I asked him, well, what kind of career, you know, will I have? Because I'm in a transitional phase. I got my degree and that was got it. Got your psychology degree. And yes, I did, a, I did a degree in psychology because when I was trying to decide what to do for my A-levels, I had this feeling that I was supposed to do something with people, that I was supposed to help people. Look, and it was, was a, a, a desire that was beyond me. You know, when you're younger, you... You know, so anyway, 
the way he described it, so I, he didn't say I was, you know, he didn't say like accountant, lawyer, teacher or something like that, that I was sort of expecting. But, you know, he was he was the real deal because he could see bigger, you know, more spiritual things. And the way he described it was all I could relate to it was like, oh, I'm going to sort of be in some kind of organization, like in a big factory with lots of people. And I'm sort of in middle management, you know, <laughs> so that you've got you know people looking up not looking up to you but you know what I mean that you're helping and organizing yeah so so that's what he said anyway I sort of forgot about all of this and just sort of like parked it away and anyway there I am back to London but at some point I think when I got to London it made sense I said at some point I can't remember when I suddenly went oh he was talking about Sajoga that's what this was, that I was born to be part of this. You know, when Chumad, you go back to England, um, Chumadaji starts giving these incredible talks at Caxton Hall, and it was so inspirational. It was so, it's like we were on a training course. That's what we were on. I actually felt when I, three years later, I went to Canada, and some of the same situations I'd been through in England started to recur. And I went, oh, my God, that was army training camps. That was barracks training, you know, that mother was taking us through so many different situations so that we would know how to deal with them, how to handle them in the right. future. And uh, and so, so yes, if, if one may ask, so um, Shamasji left, you stayed a while with Mr. Subramaniam and his family. And then you returned to London, which you never thought you would. What was it like at Dulles Hill? And, uh, you know, given you had spent so much time in India in a totally different culture, totally different environment, and the um, not so much the vibrational um, awareness at that point, probably, but the the instinct and the feeling in the heart. What was it like when you came back? So it was very, it was very different, obviously, you know, and it was a big culture shock at first, because I'd been away seven months. And to come back to this cold, grey, uh, unfriendly city, you know, where you people were far away. And I tried to explain to my father how in India, they were so hospitable. And even though I'd been places where they had nothing materially, they were so much more happier and joyful than anybody I could ever, I saw in London at that time. But I walked, yeah. I remember the first day I walked into Dollis Hill and there were photos of Shamataji all along. It was a, you walked in the hallway, it was a sort of typical little suburban house. Um, and you walk in through the hallway, the stairs going up, and then there was this double they'd knocked through. So there was a double uh, living room come dining room knocked through as one with the kitchen at the back. And I think two or three, three bedrooms upstairs. So, you know, that's how it was. But the pictures, there were photos of Shamadaji all down the back wall. And as I walked in and saw these photos, I went, what am I doing here with all these photos? And it was obviously my ego just jumped up and I just went, oh, be quiet. Just be quiet, you know. And it was also new. There were, so suddenly I'm meeting all these different people, um, largely Caucasian. There was Rustum. I think quite early on, Regis was there already from Mauritius. And such a mixed bunch, you know. And sometimes people behaving and saying things in ways that I didn't feel, you know, a mm -hmm. spiritual person. I just remember thinking, why are you talking like that? How can you say that to that person? You know, like, where is your sense of um, compassion and, and heart? But there were beautiful people there, like Maureen, Maureen and Pat and Douglas. Douglas and Maureen, I really have to, you know, thank for helping me and nurturing me through those early days um so at this point after I'd been to Bordy I got what this was I knew this was something this was this was my life this was my life and I also on some deep level just knew I, I couldn't put it into words but I knew who mother was you know knew she was just part of what i had been looking for and she would come every week we would have Monday would be programs at Caxton Hall. And the talks Mother gave were incredible. You would have a question during the week, something would come up, 
in that talk, mother would answer your question, you know? And it was a whole, I would say we would have, you know, so all the yogis would come. Most of them lived in London at that time, not all of them. Chris was in Bristol, there were some, Bala was in Birmingham, you know, spread out about. But there would be about 40, maybe 50 people. And Shumadiji, I really felt those early talks are so much about Christianity. And you felt like, and I, what I felt was that these are, I felt these are historical talks. Mother's not just yeah. talking to us. She's talking, I could feel that she's talking to change things in England in change things in the world. She's teaching us, she's telling us truths. All those early talks have all the truths that are breaking all the conditionings that were, that we had in, in England, in Britain, you know, in Europe, around the world. And so that's why these talks can be listened to again and again. On, and as we go deeper personally, you hear it on a different level. You know, you go, ah, I get what mother, you know, now I understand this. I'm, it means diff something different to me now, you know. Yeah. And she yeah. would stand up on the stage. She would give her talk. And I can, and then she would she would get down. Can you see Shumatji's photo at Kexton yeah. Hall? Yes, I can. That's the I one. That's yeah, we, we missed the India ones. We'll go back to those. But yes. Um, yes, here she is. That's it exactly. And you can see, if you go back to the other one, you can see that there's Douglas, bless him, who had at this point oh, taken care. Douglas had Douglas. taken. Yeah, this is Douglas. Yeah, so he had he had taken upon himself. He had bought. He'd started, I think, in seventy eight, recording mother's talks, and um, so he was always there every every um, program with his. Uh, eventually, he got a reel to reel tape that um, he was recording and um, he would record all her takes and was very sweet because when mother went to India and she wasn't there, he, he built up a collection of cassettes that he carried with him. And he would say, I can remember going up at the beginning of a program and saying to him, and what, what talk are we going to hear tonight when mother was in India? And he'd go, well, I'm just going to see what the vibrations pick, you know, and he just like kind of go, oh, this one, you know, and it was always perfect. So after, yeah. so here's mother giving the realization and then the next one, no, here she's giving her talk. And then the other one, she sit, sit down to give the experience of realization. And that could take some time and it would always involve the affirmations that we do. And then she would get down off the stage and start going from person to person. She would ask who's feeling vibration so she could see who could feel it, who, yeah. you know. And then she would start go off the stage and she would go around and start working on people one by one. And she never left until every person who wanted her attention, who needed it, who stayed, got worked on. And she would also direct us um, to other people like so she'd come down off the stage she'd start working on one person and then she'd say Felicity go work on this person you know and I discovered in those early days she would always send me to work on someone who had some kind of Christian background with a blocked agia you know and I learned to not talk to them too much you know because you not to get into arguments but what was happening as we were working on the person mother had given us to was that as we gave vibrations to their chakras, our chakras would clear. So it was, and so she would send us to people who had blocked chakras like ours. So it was clearing us as well, it was clearing them. And in the beginning, when I got back to England, I actually couldn't feel vibrations for six months. I had felt them in India, but in, in England, I think there was just too much agia in the country, in myself. I was thinking about, you know, what was happening. And I was worried a lot about my own chakras and not feeling. So it all blocks you, you know. And oh, and I had a bad Vishuddhi. <laughs> I had a lot of guilt in my left Vishuddhi, you know, which I didn't know how to get out of. So instead, because I didn't feel vibrations, I just would um, raise the person's kundalini and then I would just start at the bottom with my hand towards Shamadaji and I would just slowly give bandhans, you know, going up their chakras. And after some time, I just stopped 
thinking about what I was doing. And even though I couldn't feel like people say, oh yeah, you know, mother would say to people in the room who would come and she calls people over to work on the person with her. And she was teaching us how to work on people. And she would say, put your hands towards them. What do you feel on your fingers? And then she would decode. She would say, oh, this is because, you know, put your hand here. And it was interesting. She would ask people questions like someone was catching on right heart. And so she would ask that new person, you know, do you have a problem with your father or things like this? And then they would always go, oh, yes, yes, you know. And then mother would go, ha, see, now it's clear. So she showed us. The, and one thing I thought was really I learned was that very often she would hone in on what that person or who was devoted to. So yes. if it was an Indian person. She would find the deity that that family that that person's family worshipped so yeah. you know and then she would say ah Sri Durga now ask is this the cool breeze is this the Param Chaitanya of Sri Durga is this the um yeah. the cool is this the power of Sri Durga and then the they would just jump up and she'd go ha see you know she'd always be like that see so she was showing us how to uh, how to work on them she showed us very much in Dollis Hill as well, but also to some extent in Caxton Hall, how um, if there was a, a budder or a, you know, sometimes people came who were possessed with dead spirits. In those days, it was much more common. In these days, I think it's very uncommon. You know, we've reached a different level and we don't tend to get people coming to programs like that at all anymore. But in those days, it was much more common. And she would show how, if it moved, if you're working on someone and you're working on a catch and then it would clear, but then it would seem to, to jump and to move around. And mother would go, look, it's moved, look, it's moving, you know? And then she would be like, just getting getting it out because it was some entity there. If it was just like a bad or a weakness in the chakra, then you just clear it and that would be it. But also, um, I mean, there are different levels and there if you you sometimes you chose you clear the nabi and then the it goes to the heart and then you clear the heart like there's a connection between yeah. the way the chakras operate so i can remember that she wouldn't you know it could be very heavy you know you'd go to a program and i mean in those days it was a dark place to be london it, there weren't vibrations anywhere except when you were with Shrimatiji, you know, or in the ashram or at the public programs. And when you meditated at home, it took a long time. I mean, that's why we learn all these different things because it took a, a long time, you know, sometimes for Kundalini to come up and you yeah. foot soaked every day, we were very disciplined. We had lots of diets. Like I immediately was put on the liver diet and um, which was no fats. You know, I remember making, I, I thought I devised a, a biscuit, a cookie that didn't have any fat in it. I thought, oh, I've made oh, wow. something good for the liver, you know. And if I remember, would like to get a recipe soon. No, 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 wait for it. <laughs> so I, I took it and I offered one to Shumatiji and she said, it's a bit dry. She said, oh. it's good to have some fat. Your brain needs some fat in the body. <laughs> so I thought it was, it was so sweet, you know, the way she would say things and the way she would correct you and it didn't feel like correction, you know, most of the time. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, so, I mean, so one's life, I was talking to another yogini sister yesterday and she said, yeah, she said, our whole life was focused on our chakras and trying to protect ourselves you know we would go outside and mother said look at the ground look at the grass look at children look at the sky don't look at other people because our chakras were weak we would just absorb everything you know from other people and that's why she came that's why we saw so much of Shumataji because she came every Sunday most Sundays to Dollis Hill and she literally we would sit around in this living room and she would work on people individually. She would make us go to sleep. She'd say, oh, it's time for a sleep. Now you just lay down and relax. And she would sort of, I say pretend go to sleep because mother never really slept. She, her awareness was always there. And she would make us go to sleep. And then she told us that she was working through the subconscious and 
clearing out on a much deeper level, you know, so, and you would feel lighter, you know, you would feel better. And I always felt you just, you look, of course, you look forward to going because your being just felt lighter. And it's very hard to explain. People say to me, um, oh, so special, you know, you were with Sri Mataji. And I think they imagine that we were living in a world like today <laughs> where there's vibrations everywhere. It's like globally spread. You can feel your, you know, you can feel your Kundalini up. You can go into a deep meditation. I sit in front of the altar and it's just like, boom, it's just there, you know, the Agya is cleared. It wasn't like that then. And the reason we saw so much of Sri Mataji was that was the only way for her to work out the human beings on this on this level to clear her instruments. And she would say things like, I remember when Greshna came from Poland and she said, uh, ah, Poland, Greshna was the first person who came from Poland. She goes, now we can work out Poland because our chakras reflected, you know, where we were born, yeah. the country, the culture, everything we were came through. So you really, she did make you feel that yes, you had personal, you know, challenges and problems, but it was also all working out on a much bigger, more global scale. And so you really felt part of this, you know, she was just so incredibly inspiring. And, you know, you listen to those earlier talks and she's saying, you know, you're my warriors, you're my instruments, we have to change the world, this is what we're doing, you know. And at that time, the only people, can I insert a little story about marriage? So yes, very. So so we had this. So so we had Caxton Hall. We had Dollis Hill, and at the same time, Shamadji was living in Ashley Gardens in a flat in Victoria, near you know near the station. Mm -hmm. And um, amazingly enough, every so you know sometimes after programs, she would invite people to come back to her flat, or, or she would arrange a meeting you know for people. I because I, I can remember being in her flat quite a few times um, with her and with other yogis. And I should say that being in a residence of Sri Mataji was a, was a totally different experience from being at Dollis Hill or, you know, Sri Mataji in her human form as a divine being had this capacity to generate vibrations wherever she was. She was like this powerhouse that would just generate vibrations out and out and out. And when we had seminars or pujas, it was just phenomenal. We would just be elevated. You're just pushed up to this higher level and um, you can feel you know, such pain in your chakras because it's going to such a sort of deep level. But going to her place where she lived, I remember walking in through the door and I had to use the bathroom. There was a little um, cloakroom on the side. And I remember sitting in there and just feeling like I was in the womb, you know, like you're in this softness. There's a softness of vibrations that just permeates. You're in this bubble, like in a, in a cloud. And I can remember this sort of, I, it makes me feel like Sri Ganesha and Sri Mataji, that connection that like womb like connection yeah. and such a different experience wow amazing makes go thoughtless makes you go completely thoughtless absolutely i mean this is the supreme goddess herself and you know you have the privilege and the honor of being in her well, so-called house, I mean, the whole universe is a house. But yes, in this incarnation, yeah. at that time in London, amazing. Where she is living in her human form. Yeah. And um, so I was just going to say a few little stories about being in the flat, but there was uh, something came and went. Never mind. There's just, it's, you know, there's just, I realized after mother passed away, in the beginning, we shared memories with Linda for the books, which was so important. Shamataji really um, supported, you know, she inspired and encouraged Linda to collect everybody's memories and write them down for posterity. Oh, lost my train of thought. Okay, so I'll go back to being in the um, 
uh, yes, but after mother passed away, I realized, you know, so in the beginning when we were asked to share memories, I picked out really special, like momentous memories for me. And then when mother left her earthly body, I should say, I realized that every moment in her presence, something was happening, something was there, you know, that these small details could be shared, not just momentous experiences. So being in mother's flat with her, uh, one time I went. It was. I, I went, we were, there was just a few of us there. I'm not, I can't remember why or how come, you know, you couldn't just, I, at that point, um, some yeah. people did, uh, had done earlier, but at that point, you weren't encouraged to just knock on her door in her flat and say, here I am, Shamataji, you know. And um, so you would, I certainly anyway, would wait to be asked or have an invite. And I knew we were going, I was going to see mother. And I felt, cause so much had changed for me in my life. I mean, she just resurrected, you know, me, all that stuff that I had to go through to get to meet her was, was, you know, I still had the remnants of some, you know, it does give you scars and things that it takes time to, it takes time. Through. but ba basically it was, you know, essentially behind me. And I was very grateful, eternally <laughs> grateful. And I got this card and I just wanted, I was trying to think, I was trying to compose some message to express the gratitude, you know, that I felt. And in the end, I just couldn't, I tried a few times and no words seemed sufficient to express it. And finally I wrote, there are no words to express what I feel in my heart. And when I gave her that card, she looked at me and she said, that's the best, you know? So sweet. Wow. so sweet, so sweet, and yeah. so maybe to give a little flavor, if if I may, um, yeah. there's another memory that's come to mind of being in Mother's flat. So this is moving on a little bit now. From so in '79, I came in in April. I came to London. Um, during that year, a lot of founder members, I would say, came in, like Malcolm, John Watkinson, um, the Brighton Group, Ray Harris, John Glover was already there, you know, and, and quite a few others. Um, and then we had in the summer of 79, um, I won't go into a lot of depth this time, but the TMers came. Um, some people from TM got realization. So not only was mother at that period, 79, 80, we had, Shimaji gave a lot of talks about false gurus as well. She yeah. was really exposing all the false gurus who had moved into the West and were operating in England, in London, you know, TM, Rajneesh, um, the Maharishi, uh, Scientology, you know, all those ones. And we even had um, a fellow turn up at Dolly's Hill Ashram. I think Rustam had met him and invited him and he'd come, uh, he was a Mormon. So he was a Mormon and he came oh. in from the Mormon faith because it was, they had a big temple in London. And I can remember that his eyes seemed a bit glazed, you know, anyway, Shamataji was always gracious and talked. And I think there was an idea that the yogi that had brought in that, you know, maybe we can give him realization and things. And anyway, after some time, you know, he was there and he left and mother said, see, it's a mesmerism. It's a kind of mesmerism in them. She said, you don't have to yeah. yeah, she said, I couldn't get through to them. So she was doing a lot of teaching of how to handle um, false gurus, how to talk. We actually had a sort of a, I had a sort of set piece that we used to say when we were giving programs, I would say, you know, what side, side yoga is not a cult. You know, you don't have to have fatty food. You know, you know, it's not fanatical. There's not rituals and things like this. It was a sort of, oh, we don't take money. You know, there were all these things that completely set Sahaja Yoga apart. And that was very important to express that. And I think that's still very important today too, because it's become more subtle. We have this sort of whole new age, everything goes. And, and actually all the things that mother taught in the same way with the false gurus, because I had touched on TM, but had rejected it in with th within three weeks. But the say they use the same terminology, you know. They so it. I was when we went to I went to the ISPS school once. So up there in McLeod Ganj is where the Dalai Lama is. And I went into town one day, and I was looking at all these prayer mats. 
prayer flags they have um, with you know nice spiritual texts in English and I remember I started reading them and going oh well that sounds nice oh yeah that sounds kind of Sahaj you know and then as I went for that and I suddenly felt there's no vibrations there's no depth and I came out with a real headache you know but this yeah. is how false knowledge operates it takes truth and then it twists it in its own form and because it's coming from um well it's coming from an evil desire to to confuse and to actually destroy people's chakras um it's embedded with all these these catches and you know these awful things and when the tm people came shimadachi you know was very clear you know if you've been studying tm you catch on left left fishudi ag ego and um, left Shwadistan, you know, because you're saying mantras, it's impure knowledge, and you're paying money because you think, you know, this is how it's going to work. Yes. And uh, so that was, that was, you know, quite an experience absorbing and learning how to help the TMers, and most of them all just was too much for them, you know, which shows the depth of the damage that they just couldn't stick on and hold on. And then we had this lovely group that came up from Brighton, um, such a collective they were like they were like um, what do you call it the example of collective open-hearted warm yogis whereas in London we were sort of there was a lot there was a lot of I remember at one point feeling like oh I think I'd like to move to Brighton you know they're so warm you feel really loved there but every time I would come back to London because in London I could feel this depth you know there was a, a much more of a depth I mean mother was there and there was just this deeper depth that I, I wanted to feel. Um, so 79 was an interesting but, um, year of people coming in and establishing themselves and the collective growing. So it grew a lot in 79 until we moved into 80. So it was quite a bit bigger. So I, the reason I was saying that because the memory I wanted to share in Mother's Flat involved a lot more of these people who then come in. Yeah. You know, we had Jim and Hillary um so uh, so I think this was I'm just I hope this has some relevance it was very important I every so often Shamadichi would just so she had this ability to be Mahamaya you know oh, yeah. you, in a group with her and she'd be talking about the curtains or you know sometimes she'd talk about world of you know current affairs what was happening the things or what was happening in different countries putting our attention on things but sometimes she'd just be talking about you know the color of the curtains or this of the carpet or this and that you know and then we were in her flat in Ashley Gardens and there must have been about 20 it seemed like most of the collective was there and again, she's sitting in the chair in the window bay. I remember the light coming in behind her. And it seemed like she'd just been, I don't even remember what she was talking about, but suddenly the tone changed. And mm -hmm. I felt like the weight of the vibrations changed. And she said to us, and she just looked at us all, and she said, you are the foundations of Sajogo, on which I'm building I can't remember that I'm building on, on you as the foundations, but I am sending you the children and they are the ones that are going to change the world. And we will build a school. Wow. We will have a school that they can come to and I will raise the children in the school and you will can come. And, and I remember feeling like, oh, oh, I'm a teacher. You know, at that point I'd done a, I had done a, a teach. So it must've been 81 because I had done a teaching postgraduate um, in right. education and I thought oh I would like that and she said and you can come and work there I never did but she said you know she she sort of opened it up to us um, westerners weren't mm -hmm. encouraged in, in the long run but it was just this vision of this like I guess in our worldly terms like a temple that the foundation stone and you felt that she's just filling us and filling us with so much knowledge and experience and there were so many dramas going on like that mother engineered you know after a while I began to see she'd create this situation with a yogi that then she would talk to us about about what has happened you know I remember so I have to say for example we all thought everything Indian was wonderful and she matched one of the yoginis, this lovely yogini, to an Indian man outside of such, supposedly, you know, that they were interested or whatever, married him 
to to I think she married him and so she was getting the saris and the bangles and all these nice things and then within a few days or a week or so the whole thing was cancelled and it and mother talked about it and she said no no it wasn't a sarjogi the family was this and that and that and we went oh not every Indian is amazing you know <laughs> we don't need to <laughs> have that desire to be married to you know Indian people so I would say like every week nearly something or every yeah. other week you know something was happening and it was such a close-knit family situation that we realized you know I think it taught me to be very non-judgmental and compassionate because you realized you could see how mother is using this yogi to expose this for us all to learn and we had a sort of saying there but for the grace of god go i i'm not in trouble this week but it could be me next week you know oh and <laughs> to the point that if mother started praising someone that person would go uh oh what's going to happen to me you know <laughs> so it was just like you know we were we were all in this, it's kind of a bit like being in boarding school, it felt sometimes, because, you know, you were so <laughs> tight knit. So there were no secrets. There were no mm -hmm. secrets. Mother, we were just this big family. If something happened with one person, and mother would explain. And I think that's why I realized, and talking to you, I adopted that with my children. So we lived in many ashrams, and sometimes you could see really odd, off behavior. And I would always say, I would always yeah. talk to them about what was happening, what they could see. And I would say, well, you see, uncle has this weakness, a little bit weakness there. So that's why he's reacting like that. So I would never make them feel that he was a bad person or a bad yogi or anything like that. It was just, that's how it is right now, you know? And he's working through this, or so he's learning this. So I think that's really important quality and value that to some extent is still not established in Sajoba collectives. That when something happens to somebody, they get sick. It's like, oh, what have they done wrong? You know, oh, why is that catching for them? Or, or you know, they get into a, a car accident or something. I think we have to, it's really important to see the bigger picture. A, they might be working something out. A mother said, each one of us works out for 10,000 people. So, that comforted me through a lot of challenges and, you know, trials and tribulations within Sajoga of, okay, this feels really personal, but I know mother said, if I can help work through this, this will help other people because she really emphasized monkey see monkey do, you know, that she told that story about the monkeys on the different islands and how one group learned to, um, I can't remember, use a tool or, or drink a certain <laughs> way. And then the others on the other islands learned that yes. too, without being in contact. Yes, I think Linda had shared that story in the first set of golden memories that we did about the hundred monkey monkeys effect or something, the critical mass that is needed yeah. and how it just kind of snowballs into... Now that, what you just said, the critical mass, that is very in, important point because mother emphasized that. The more yogis we got, the, the faster things would move, the more changes would happen. And, and I could see that, you know, in Canada when we first were there, how we had seven and then we got to 16 and you felt something vibrationally change. Then we got to 21, you know, and she said a, a long time ago, she said, you know, when it reaches a, a certain big number, cancer will be eradicated. You know, that's what she said. Um, so, so critical mass is, I mean, there are just so many things that I realized we just absorbed and sort of embedded into my being that you carry with you for life. And they pop up every so often when you need them, you know, to smooth a situation, to understand a situation. So yeah. that's why it's so, so, so nice so, that yeah. you, yeah. you and the other yogis who spend so much time with Sri Mataji in her physical presence uh, are sharing those moments because I think for the future generations, we are the in-betweeners really, but for the future generations, their connection to Srimataji is entirely personal in an intangible way. But, you know, listening to your stories, it just makes it all so much more 
sort of real fits as not a proper word. Yeah, it just kind of yeah, and and it's sort of. I mean, still, like, you in India in 79, how simple life was there, and given how life is now there and here, the problems still remain the same, you know, the eating disorders or the sleeping disorders still very much there. So there are so many seekers who would probably, hopefully, relate to it and find mother's love in, in, the, in the words that you all are sharing. So at this point... I'd like to share this photo of it's a Guru Puja. Oh, talk. There we are. Okay. So this is a different. So this is in. Um, this was seventy nine in December. So at this point, at this puja, this is such a beautiful photo. Wait, wait, wait. Go back. Go back. <laughs> You're jumping. Can you can you go back? Yeah. Okay. Shall I go back to this one? Yeah. This one? No, yes. Yeah. Any of them. But actually that one that you were on was the right one. <laughs> that first one. I was just going to... Yeah. No, um, one. no, no. The other one. Yeah. So this was after. So in 79, there we were in Dollis Hill. And sometimes you wouldn't know. Like Shumata, she would... It wasn't so pre-planned. She would come and then she would just say, oh, we're going to do a Guru Puja you know, and so things were much more informal in those days. And this was yeah. after the puja. And this is such a beautiful photo. You see how, how youthful and young mother looks in this picture. And we noticed that when eventually she started to go to Australia and travel around the world, photos taken in the different countries often reflected how the yogis were, how that country was. And when she would come back from Australia in the beginning, the photos were like this, very open and warm and um, untroubled. But this was a, a special photo taken by the first Western um, yogi. Patricia told me that he took her camera to take this photo um, wow. and after the Guru Puja. And then if you go to the other ones, not the the book, not that one, but the next, yeah. So, so Patricia, said, so this one here, Shumadaji mm -hmm. said you could see the three channels. This was the three yeah. channels being exposed. So I think this was very early on, mm -hmm. maybe even the first set of miracle photos, certainly in England that we saw. And Patricia just was taking photos with her little camera. And then when they were developed, this came and she thought, oh, it's because the battery is going down or something. But Shumadaji said, no, this is the vibrations you can see. So we have this photo here and then we have two others and you can see the next one. See how mother's moving her hand and the, yes. the vibration is sort of is following it. And we had one yogini who was on very much in the superconscious. She'd been in TM and one time we were with her and she said she saw mother in the program every time mother lifted her every time she might lifted her hand and even she was she was talking and she was just like moving her hand around or you know going like this and she said she could see the vibrations coming out and like slaying some bootish thing in the room you know so just even this gesture <laughs> that she did you know later sometimes she would go ha like that and you could see there but even in a public formal setting you know she was just her hands, everything was incredible. And so here you could actually see, you know, wow. how the vibrations were moving and, and working. Mm -hmm. And then if you go down to the next, so so after the puja, mm -hmm. they had, this was the signing of the advent. This was the very first book that was written in English about Sajoga. And Shumadaji made a really, big thing about it Gregoire was mm -hmm. writing it she would advise him she would get him to rewrite things re reorganize the chapters and finally it was ready and it came out and they came with boxes of the books to this for the puja and after the puja oh so I can show you after the puja yeah so so what happened was that they would take a, a new book out of the box and then look around the room and someone would be called up to be given a copy of this. This is the book, The Advent, with Mother's picture on the front. 
and then she would take the new book and as you saw in the photograph yeah. she would open it at this page and then she would write and she wrote in Devanagari which is she said the written language of Sanskrit and you know I what, was I what, didn't quite can I read I, out what you what Shumataji wrote for you please can you open that yes message? yes I will so it says here I so I wrote it because I couldn't remember exactly yeah um but it's really nice to see Shumataji yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find it. In, in Hindi oh it's here it just, is here it is. So I wrote, she was sitting, the day Shumadaji signed the advent, she was sitting in Dollis Hill Ashram with her back to the window in a big comfy armchair with the books beside her. She was always so motherly and someone was asking the yogis to come up in front of her one by one. Then they would say the name of that yogi and Shumadaji would take a new book and write inside. She explained that she was writing in Devanagari. Devanagiri. I thought she was just writing her name in yeah. it, like Western authors do. But when I went up to receive the book, instead, she explained what she had written. The translation of what she had written in my book said, To my daughter Felicity, with loving blessing, your mother Nirmala. Yes. Can you imagine what it feels like to have a book like that, so beautifully written? the first one ever edited and supervised by the divine herself, the goddess, all about truth, yeah. the real truth of our lives. She said we should wrap this book in the cloth with four corners folded and keep it in a special place like a Bible and only look at it with clean, washed hands. So I, I have done that. Yeah, that's what she said. And she, in fact, at one time, I, there was a little story I wanted to mention, but um, uh, something had happened to one of the yogis and he'd been affected by mesmerism and she, he came up and, and she said to him, read the Abdavent, that will clear your agya, read the Advent. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's okay if you don't read the first two more intellectual chapters. Maybe they don't seem so intellectual now. I should have to have a look. <laughs> I find we can, you know, read a lot more, but certainly the middle chapters I remember reading and they've got lots of memories of, of how Sajogis got at that time, got their realization and explanations of the Kundalini and Sajoga. You know, it was such a, you felt, and Shumadachi said this, that she was actually, she was trying things out. She was trying to understand human beings with all their complications and permutations and, you know, what would clear them, what would, you know, work things out for them. And she, one thing that I also, that Im impressed me, so we were also trying different ways to spread Sai Yoga, you know, to organize programs. Um, I remember organizing, well, anyway, not that memory, this memory. <laughs> so in order to, so we didn't have internet, nothing like that. All we no. could use was newspapers with photographs, which were quite expensive, it was always important to use the photograph. You know, Shumataji couldn't stress enough how it was the photograph that drew people in, the photograph that gave realization, the photograph that spread vibrations. So we were all always trying to find ways to use mother's photo. So one day I had this idea um, that, you know, this would be a, a free way was to create a little postcard and put the little black and white photo of Shumataji, the, the standard one we use, I can show you later, I have a copy, in the corner and then just have right, you know, advertising local programs like that. And I brought it to Shumataji to see, uh, you know, uh, so she, she didn't so much, she did give direction, but she really encouraged, it was very collaborative, you know, I mean, because she wanted us to learn for ourselves. She wanted us to grow in confidence, to become our own gurus. So she encouraged us to come up with ideas, you know, suggestions, how to, she would ask you, ask us, you know, well, how could we do this? You know, what do you think would work? Things like that. So I brought this postcard, but despite that, I thought she would give some, you know, analytical comment. She would say, oh, well, this could be good. You could do this, or I don't, you know, I was expecting some kind of commentary. I showed her and she said, try it that's what she said okay. try it. and that's that was her attitude let's try it and if it doesn't work we find something different you know so 
that's very important. She was very spontaneous and practical. And there wasn't necessarily, of course, there's always the dharmas and morality, which are fixed. But the other things were more flexible, you know, mm -hmm. try it and see how it works. And your guiding thing was, does it have vibrations? You know, that's it. So I was, so as I said, I didn't feel vibrations in the beginning, the, the first year or so, not would come occasionally, you know, just suddenly. And I was, one day I was foot soaking and meditating in front of her picture. And for, I was listening to music and my attention went away from the picture and I was just looking to the side and I suddenly, I must have just sort of relaxed. And I suddenly noticed I was feeling vibrations. It was really flowing. And I went, oh, I'm feeling right. And then I looked back at the photo and it stopped. And I thought, oh, this is so weird. So I went to Shmataji and I asked her about this because it worried me, you know. And she just sort of went quiet for a bit. And she said, as long as you're feeling vibrations, you don't worry. Later, what I think it was, was that I definitely still had bootish things inside me. And I think when I looked at mother's picture, they all like, you know, woke up, I don't like this. And everything just sort of, you know, kind of stopped. But then when I looked away, everything relaxed and it flowed. And in a way, that's what I noticed that when I was, you know, out in the bank, standing in a bank queue, suddenly I'd feel like vibrations yeah you know so I think it's okay if you come in to Sajog you get realization and you you have problems you know you've come from a background and we don't always know it at first um we don't see until you know we can have this honeymoon period where vibrations are flowing you feel really nicely and then suddenly it's not going so well and you're not feeling so good and I mean maybe not so much but still there may be people who feel that and you basically just don't panic don't worry be patient it's just your kundalini has gone down deeper to work something deeper out and that if you just be relaxed and be normal it will come back again so some days you can have a really amazing meditation you're just sitting there and suddenly it's just there and you feel you know that oneness and you feel all you want to be is just one there with mother and I've learned you just try to stay in there don't go oh I have to go make dinner or breakfast just enjoy that time and then there are other times yeah. uh, there are other times where you can be there and you said the mantras you've listened to mother's talk somehow maybe your heart just hasn't quite opened or connected and you just go okay you know I just come back to it and you just you just accept you know you be surrendered in that way when you have a really special meditation enjoy it if you have a day when you don't it's okay, just have an extra foot soak or, you know, get some lemons. But I really, it's taken me a long time to understand. I mean, Shumadji, I remember a birthday puja we had. And after the puja, she went, now just go and enjoy yourselves. And I thought, yeah. I don't know. How do, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you do that? You know, <laughs> just go enjoy yourself. And, and now, and she would say in the public programs she would say now be pleasantly placed towards yourself and I thought what does that mean and it means just feel That's nice wow. towards yourself yeah just feel nice about yourself you know and over the years it's it's I think that's important. I arrived in Cabela one day. I know this is off point and I'd had a very we'd had I don't know why but I arrived in my chakras court I could feel it I was not in a very good state and I sat outside the, the castle in on the grass and I just said to mother I'm so sorry I'm like this <laughs> you know I'm so sorry I'm like this um but you know it will get better and you'll show me how please help me and I just was like up front you know this is this is how it is and I but I'm here mother and I love you very much and and I could feel it just sort of like falling off me you know so I, I wasn't guilty that was the thing I didn't feel guilty it was just you know circumstances I guess behind sometimes you don't know why you've got caught up why you've absorbed things my mother said that that really helped me in the early days she said you are like tape recorders. You are my tape recorders. You are absorbing all that negative stuff outside 
and then you just clear it out. You have you erase it. Your foot so you meditate, you erase it. So it's part of it's part of being a yogi, you know. Okay. And and she, you know, and that's what it was like in those early days because there were so few of us, so few places had been vibrated. You know, London was not full of at all full of vibration, and you had to just protect yourself and keep your attention on yourself. And I remember in like 15 years, and we were in the ashram in Vancouver, and I suddenly, I was sitting at the kitchen table and I suddenly felt like, I think it's okay to go and interact more with the world. Cause I would go to work. I wouldn't spend much time in the staff room and I would come home, you know? And I suddenly felt, oh, I think it's okay. And then, so in those days we didn't have much internet then and we wouldn't hear mother's talks there was no live transmissions you know no. three weeks later someone would send you a cassette um, of the talk and I heard the talk that Shamadaji had been giving around the time I'd had this feeling at this puja and she said now I want you to go out into the world and spread vibrations you know and so from then on I wore mother's pendant outside because in England in London you couldn't wear sari bindi you couldn't mention that you meditated if you said to someone that you meditated they stood back and looked at you like you've got your mental case there's some <laughs> weakness in you that needs meditation okay i don't it's need to healthy. be with you you know <laughs> and gradually over time you know the world became more global internet came out and i could feel more acceptance and then when mother said this I went, it's okay. So I wore my pendant outside. And I when I went to school the next time, somebody saw it. And she said, Oh, is, who's that? You know, and I said, Oh, it's this is my teacher, meditation. You know, I do meditation. She went, oh, meditation. Oh, I would like to do that. And I just went, Oh my goodness, how things have changed. And and so then it eventually it grew and changed to a point that doctors and meditation became mainstream. First it became mainstream, then all the other people jumped on and created their own meditation. And then now doctors, you know, it's it's and there was that sense in the early days of East and West. There was the Western analytical mind, the science mind, and then there was the spirituality of the East. And the two did not meet, you know. And if you try to combine them, people just like, no, you know, don't want that. That's something weird and odd. And then just gradually, gradually, you know, I think the Indian fusion music that started happening helped a lot. And you could see this this melding, this fusion, and now it's so mainstream. So so much someone said to me quite some years ago you know looking at the world they said looking at the world today all these awful things you know we see around how is it going to change and i said to them so much of what mother has promised us in those early talks those early days has already happened you know sajoga is now on a global but base, it's in all these different countries. There's so many, and now today, speaking today, you know, through the blessing of internet and the ether, it reaches everywhere. And so I said, why wouldn't, if so much has already happened that she's promised, why wouldn't the rest happen? So it's really important. I think all of us feel that now, you know, whatever is going on outside, it's part of the divine play. We cannot understand on a human level why these wars are still going on but it's part of the divine play and maybe i could share one very special memory from caxton hall which is relevant to this yes, so mother chamaraji had finished her program she'd come down off the stage she was working on someone about two rows behind me i was still sitting in my chair i wasn't feeling good i had all kinds of thoughts just making me feel not good in my head and Shumati she just said Felicity I shot up <laughs> turned around she said come here I went towards her and she looked at me and she said don't you know I have more power in my little finger than in all the work all the negativity in the world put together wow and and whoa and that's what we have to remember that however big and gross all these things are 
yes, we are instruments. Yes, we have a role to play. Yes, we need to spread and give realization. But the bottom line is the divine is there and has her hand in everything. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't be worried in ourselves. We should be pleasantly placed and feel good, you know, within ourselves. Wow. So. Oh, that's so blissful. Is I was just going to ask you about um the declaration, Shamataji's declaration. Oh was it about the same time as the advent? Was it or not? So yes, because the signing of the advent came after that puja. So this Guru Puja was the one where Shumataji declared who she is. And I won't go into that, but it was it was amazing. I felt like we'd sort of been hidden away in a pillowcase and mother had come out and said who she was. And I just remember, I think we all felt like, ah, oh, she's done it. She said who she is, you know? And it's like, for me, we, we all knew who she was and we were just waiting for her to say it, you know? And she, and she had said, I'm not going to be crucified like Jesus was, but it changed something. It really did. You felt like some, again, this was one of those historical moments where you felt, you know, something fundamental has changed in the world yeah special. wow that is so fantastic could absolutely I, absolutely phenomenal could i add the story that i got waylaid from about the marriages um so when she was Please saying do. when she was saying about the foundation i forgot that that was part of it so when she said about us being the foundation mm -hmm. stone and she would send the children to us she then talked about marriage and yeah. she said she said, all of you must get married and all of you must have children. If, and this is, she said this, she said, if any of you don't want to get married, then get out of Sajo. I don't want you. <laughs> and it was very clear that was our job was to have these children, <laughs> you know, and yeah. even one couple, bless them, um, had had some procedure to not have children because they didn't want to bring children into this terrible world and went and reversed it you know because you know mother said wow. this and, and it was so sweet so so because I was talking about this with my daughter recently and we were saying how different it is for the young people getting married today because when we got married we all had children straight away you know and all our attention and our lives were focused on Saj yoga, spreading Saj yoga, building the collective, not on careers. I mean, some people, you know, were already on a career tra trajectory and could, you know, continue with that. But I mean, I, I could have done, you know, I could have gone on and done masters or this or that. And it just wasn't important. It was important to have the children. We all had the children, you know, within yeah. the first year. And, um, and then I was just waiting, you know, I was just waiting for them to grow up. And, you know, you had such a strong sense. I just knew these were mother's children, you know. It she was, said, yeah, it actually, sorry, reminding me of uh, Shramataji's talks to the bride and groom in Kabela in 2002 when Shankarji and I got married. And Shramataji said much quite the same, how important marriage was and that there were so many souls waiting to be born. Yes, um, yes, that's what she and, said. And uh, yeah, so it really, it really is very, very special. First of all, that that Shimatsu married us all, and 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 that we have been blessed with these sort of special souls that she has set, given us to look after, and a divine purpose, <laughs> and, and, and the purpose of our life. Absolutely, yes. absolutely, yes. yeah. I think Go it's on. A a little bit different for the younger people now because I was so amazed when I started to see them all doing masters doctorates you know the the, the women the yoginis and waiting you know getting to know each other um, being married getting to know each other and waiting for the children and I thought oh this is this is a nice sort of reversal you know because times yeah. have changed. times have changed yeah. things are different and we can do things you know differently and you see all these beautiful babies and that was reminding me of baby naming. So yes. when the first children were born, 
um, in England, English, you know, in an English culture. At the very first one, like Maureen's ones, mother gave the name Athena. And we went, oh, that's nice. It's sort of Greek, you know. And then another child was given the name Marina again. And there were a couple of others like that. And then mother moved into the Sanskrit names. Wow. Now, this was a big thing because we are in those times where, you know, even though in Britain had been in colonial India, you know, and had these connections, it was not something that was respected, I think. Mm -hmm. And she started giving the children these Indian names and she made it quite clear that we should use these names because they carried vibrations. And every time we said the name, it was like a mantra and it was like vibrations going out into the world and it was change something. And I could feel that. I could feel that. It was like, it was the beginning of embracing the beauty and the good things from the East, you know, of the spirit. And this went on for and it was very difficult for some of us I mean the grandparents were like what what is this name you know how do you even say it I can't say how that do you, name, you know <laughs> and they would struggle with this name I remember um you know and even with uh my, my elder son's called Galtama and she, we were in Canada and mother wasn't there and I wrote and said you know would mother give him a name and she said no wait till wait wait till later so that didn't happen till much later um when uh, um yeah so he was michael that's right he was michael's son so it didn't happen till much later until he was like five ah And then when we when he got his name, it's just like, what, what? And my mother-in-law just refused to call him, you know, and just kept calling. So for, for at least six months, maybe even a year, he had like these two names. And then gradually, eventually, because we always referred to him as Gautama, she switched over, you know, but so many of them. So when it came to my daughter, uh, Richard and I, we, who was born in England, we said, we're not going to give her any other name, no Western name, just wait for mother. And then we were able to take her to Chelsham Road. We were in England at the time and Matshamadji named her Shreya. And we said, that's it, no other name. So they can't sort of slip around and, you know, say, oh, we're going to call him by the Western name, you know? <laughs> and so she only ever had had the one name and it was because of that, you know? So, so there was, so that was so interesting how seemingly a small thing, like giving a Sanskrit name had such a bigger vibrational impact, you know? And eventually by the time, so this would have been 10 years later, 12 years later, um, then Shumataji just stopped to some extent. You know, I remember with my third son, again, we'd been in Canada, so we had actually picked a Sanskrit name for him. Um, and we had this beautiful Hamsa Puja in, Vancouver and after the puja so this was the this was the custom that after the puja any new babies would be brought up and presented to Shumataji that's why you have those photos of the babies on mother's lap and she would hold them and she would just sort of be with them for a bit and then she would give the name you know that suited the person the baby and but at this puja she asked what was the name that we had, everyone had already given some kind of name because we hadn't seen mother for a year, you know? So the baby has to be registered. It has to have a name to be registered. So everyone had registered some kind of name, but she would ask, she would ask, um, you know, I remember one boy, the baby said, what's the name? And they said, Christopher. And then she gave a Sanskrit name that was, I can't, like Christian or something, Christian, that was like the English name. And we had managed to, um, with my friend's help, we picked Davindra for my son. And uh, she said, what's his name? And I remember saying, well, mother would really like, you know, because you, of course you, you would like mother to pick an auspicious name. And she said, and I said, Davindra. And she said, yes, yes, but what's his name? I said, Davindra, she said, very good name, you know. And after that time, it stopped more. She just gradually, and she just finally, she just said, no, you can, you can choose. So the, the purpose, you know, in a way had had passed, but so many little things like that. For example, my daughter, bless her, you know, she put a lot of emphasis on how we dressed, 
uh, how we respected ourselves, especially in England, because England doesn't really have in some ways, in some ways it can have a very formal dress culture, but in everyday life, even now I see sometimes people out shopping in there, so it looks like their leisure wear, which looks like pajamas, you know, you'd never oh, no. see We have that. seen people in pajamas and yes, in the shop. So you'd never see yeah. that in North America, never, because people have, in a way, more self-respect, you know, to, to do that, that you yeah. you go out and you dress properly. Yeah, and an Indian. So, so, so yeah. we, we uh, and she said to me one time, I came, and this is when I was, recently got such realization, and I was wearing a pair of corduroys, and they weren't tight, tight, but they obviously must have been tighter. And she said to me, it's not good to wear tight clothes. You know, these were trousers, these were like pants, you know. So I never wore them again. I never wore anything in mother's presence other than a skirt or a dress. And and she talked a lot about, you know, how important it was for us to wear saris at the pujas. You know, you you must wear saris. Yeah, the last uh, Vali puja, you were wearing a lovely pink sari and, and you mentioned the sari. There was a story behind the sari. Ah, it, yes, but that's... Yeah. Well, that, it's... <laughs> That was coming later because I was going to move on to the marriages. I I think. Um, oh yes. Oh yes. You know, yes. So I just I guess I just kind of, I, so that I was just going to finish with. Um, yes. So I used to dress my daughter in dresses, bless her. And we are living in North America, where my sister in law turned up to a wedding or a funeral in a pantsuit. You know which we would never do coming from Europe, you know, you would wear dresses and things. So they have a very kind of different dress code there. And the children would go to school, there wasn't school uniform, they would pick their own clothes. And most of I would say, you know, three quarters of the little girls all wore trousers. But I always would insist that Shreya wore um, a dress, bless her. And she's, you know, sometimes she would say, in fact, we talked about this recently, and she said, you know, I felt so different from the other children. And I, and I said to her, you know, I'm so sorry, honey, but it just felt so important at the time. It felt like it yeah. was important that there was somebody there who was saying, this is how the feminine can be, you know, this is how to, to look nice and you know, be a Lakshmi quality. You know, there's ways of being, I mean, I would say Shumataji was the supreme feminist in that she so supported women, women's roles, the strength of women, but as women, that you don't have to detract from yourself as women, that you can dress in a beautiful way. You can dress, you know, and of course, it, we all wear trousers at, at, at home and things because, it's convenient and it's comfortable. But when I put a skirt on and when I wear dresses, when I go out, it changes something. I feel different, you know, and that was something that I think she she brought out. And so there's my poor daughter, bless her, wearing dresses, you know, but it was these little things that seemed, you know, really important in those days. So I think that's me done for 79, 80, you know, gradually, gradually in 1980, Shumataji, so pretty much 79, I would say mother was establishing the roots, um, the TM people came, the Brighton people came, we were picking up people just arriving, um, getting realization, all with big important stories about their self-realization. Oh, you know, this happened, uh, how mother had sort of got them to the program, you know, and even yeah. people saying that they recognized one another. Mother had said, you know, a lot of us had all been together before with her. And and I remember particularly one um, yogi brother entering into Chelsham Road. And I just, something in me went, oh, oh, I, you know, I felt this connection. I thought, oh, I'd like to get to know him. And later on through some experiences, I realized that we'd actually been together in a previous life, you know. So there were lots of these little subtle things that were making you feel that your life was important, you know that you had a, an important role to play. And then we moved into the 80s. There were more seminars. We were having different seminars, which really helped, you know, boost and clear. Shumadaji said to us, a puja in her presence was worth five years meditation. So, you, so you can imagine um, in those days, particularly, you know, now I feel like we go to Cabela, a puja in Cabela, 
has that same, you know, depth. You feel mother's presence there. You feel that depth of, of clearing. And so seminars would be, you know, really big vibrational clear outs and occasions for us. And then Shramadaji started, she traveled all around England in the 80s, you know, going to different cities. People were organizing programs, you know, Bristol, um, Plymouth, Exeter, Birmingham, Sheffield, all around. And yeah. then, and then, and still, and doing, uh, we had uh, seminars and pujas in France because Marie was there, established in France, Gregoire was in Switzerland, his family were establishing Switzerland, he went to Italy, helping establish Rome. So Europe really started coming up, you know, and people, when we had a puja, everyone would come from everywhere, you know, for for the puja. So we had a puja in France, wow. so everyone would come from the different countries. And then we went into 81, the end of 80, 81, then Shumatiji, particularly, 80 must have been Australia, she went to going to Australia and then um, Road? America. Chelsham Road was mid mid eighties, the summer, June, oh, June. Okay. But we'll talk about the ashrams in a, a later one. And then uh, eighty one was America and Canada, and um, which then took me into eighty two when I got married. Yes, it's when I got married. Okay, I'd like to share some photos of the. 1982 India tour, some really amazingly beautiful historical photos. Uh, if you could talk us through them, please. So this was my first proper tour in India. Um, there were about 80, 85 yogis on this tour, lots of Australians. Um, mm. uh, I think not so many men, more women. And it was a, a different, so it was, we we didn't travel with Shamataji in the same way. She would, we would go to somewhere and she would arrive and come there. And mm. I think we only had like two buses, maybe three maximum uh, that we traveled on. And it was for two and a half months. We arrived at uh, the end of December. Some people came. I I think I arrived. Yeah, that last week of December, beginning January, and the tour was essentially around Maharashtra, and it eventually culminated in the marriages in Delhi in um, March, and so we got to travel around Maharashtra, going to all these villages which would set up these beautiful processions look at Shamataji and she just mm -hmm. took us to these amazing places with these beautiful villagers humble people who just you know what it must be like to be in that kind of pure vibrational state that you just can feel who Shamataji is so thousands we had you know, a program in one village, it was always in the outdoors and people were on the rooftops, were on the, hanging out the windows. And she often traveled and wore this sari, the white sari with the red, red border. border. Do you remember that is symbolic of something? Because in India, traditionally only the widows wore white, but I had a feeling the mother said it was something to do also with the guru. Do you remember? Uh, the the white sari with the red border the um in certain parts of india um the the married women wear it but also uh it it is it's not it's not the white just plain white is the color of the widow but yes the white sari shmataji wore in caxton hall uh program especially those that were just just pure white um they were a symbol of of guru and so I guess it was easier for people probably, you know, to absorb what she was saying rather than, I don't know, it's just my, my <laughs> humble understanding of the situation. So um, you would see, see a lot of, there's quite a lot of photos with mother dressed with his sari. So this, this is, um, is that all? Well, I thought I had some other tour ones. That's that I, Puja. Yes, no, um, I... I I had sent some single ones, but not to worry. You got the sense. Okay, so this is Shiva Puja, but this is after the marriages. Um, 
so we we were in we were engaged so maybe we'll let's switch this off and i will say the stories about the tour um is that okay is that okay yeah, and lead us in to the marriages which were quite unique the year we got married the process so that's what i was going to share um there was a very beautiful tour we went to Sita's bath place we traveled down dusty very hot roads it was very physically demanding mother had to give a whole talk about not putting attention on your physical discomforts and your you know this was penances and and everywhere we arrived in the night and the villagers would have cooked food for us and it didn't matter what time you arrived you needed to eat because they you know made all this huge effort and it was a real um a shedding of conditionings of your physical conditionings you know sometimes we were crammed like sardines on very slim mattresses in in rooms um or you know 20 of us in one room and so physical conditionings but also it gave the opportunity to cleanse vibrationally and halfway through the tour i remember just feeling like i was in a different place you know that that spiritual etherealness of of india with by the rivers and she sent us to bathe in rivers with mud that we had to you know take handfuls and rub and make, give ourselves like mud mud massages and so many so many different things and she was traveling around giving realization to different towns so every two three days we'd be moving on there'd be puja there'd be public program and look at this tour so beautiful so they look at that they create this beautiful sort of palaquin for Shumadaji to travel on with the bullocks pulling and everybody would um, travel in front of her and often there were musicians who'd be dancing and you know singing and then take her to the place where she would do the public program or the puja that is so so special so special look at the the sky yes we didn't have any rain i don't remember you're muted smita oh sushmita i see you've muted yourself Okay. Yeah, there are no words to describe this beautiful memories you're sharing because, you know, in, in India, traditionally, because uh, people are spiritual, religiously inclined, they know the divine and they know there is God. They take out processions of God, you know, and there's a lot of love and devotion. It may, may not always be true or the real uh, thing. But here to have the goddess herself in that procession, my God, that is just yes, awesome. Vibrant. Yes. And we would have these programs outside. So we would be sitting on the earth. And, and it's really special to be in a program where you're sitting on the earth in India. You know, it's a, it's a different experience. It's such a vibrated land. The vibrations are, are just, you can't describe the quality and the depth of the vibrations in India. It's the Kundalini yeah. of the world. It's just very special. And uh, it was a very, we were very blessed that mother gave us this opportunity to learn from the Indians, you know, to learn about humility and, and devotion and surrender, you know, surrender. We, we had to um, overcome all these physical different things so so we traveled around all of Maharashtra and we ended up in we came to Vaiturna and um, Vaiturna which was we stayed I think we were near this this dam and the the manager the person who there was an Indian gentleman who like oversaw all of this and mother mentions in the talk how humble he was and how you wouldn't know you know he wasn't like an English person sort of you know being the big wig kind of thing yes <laughs> he was just he was just this very humble humble man I mean you you absorbed a lot by being with the Indian yogis and um that was something I we noticed too that they were so I mean you know we were like wrecks of people compared to them but they would be so hospitable and some of them would come up and you know would work on you or would help you or give you some you know spiritual um bit of wisdom and all these things contributed to changing you inside you know for your growing and, and for changing i mean there's something about india 
tours you know nowadays we have realization tours and when you're in a position to be part of a tour that's giving realization that's spreading side yoga that's doing what your mother wants us to do you get just so many blessings and you grow you know we would come back from india tour and and i we began to realize that the effect of having vibrational effects of having been on the tour for that long and absorbing all these vibrations could last like six months afterwards you know you'd still be on this kind of high you know from this these different feelings of being so much more yes positive and so we got to Vaitana and we were sitting you know as was the once Madhuchi was there and we were at her feet and suddenly she said so I had um she had actually told me at the end of 81 in Brahman court to come to India. They'd been making organize, organizing to go to India on the tour. And she said, Felicity, you should come. So I hadn't been going to come. I didn't really have the money, but it all came together in the Sahaj way it does. And I went on the tour and suddenly at some point I felt something change in me and I felt it's time to get married. I felt like I'd done as much growing as I could as a single person. And I felt I want someone to look after and be companionable with, you know? So I put my name on the list and we are in India and we're in Vaitana and suddenly Shumadaji says, all those with your names on the marriage list, please stand up. So we all stood up, there was about 27 of us, all the men, you could see the men on the men's side, ladies on the ladies' side. And then we sat down and she must have had the list with her, I think, because she then proceeded to talk about each person individually, even though half of them she had not met officially or physically. Wow. And each person that stood up, she if they had a weakness, she would say, you know, oh, oh they have their, this is their challenge, this, this and this. And then she would say something nice. She always balanced it with something good. And so she went round the whole room like this, you know, and I remember, yeah. And, uh, and then she said to us, okay, now you go away and you write down on a list the names of three people you would like to marry. And I went like, what? <laughs> I didn't <laughs> sign up for this because at that point we had, we had had, um, quite a few uh, we'd had collective marriages in England so we'd had one lot of 16 I think one lot of 12 couples um there were a few like maybe half a dozen individual couples who'd been married before then and I'd had some different experiences uh which I felt mother had helped work out my sort of expectations or conditionings of of who I should marry etc and I had become completely surrendered I, I tell you I had a very sweet story we were this was when we were in a mill farm in Yetminster the open your heart seminar and at that time after the puja and everything there was discussion about matches and marriages and mother was suggesting people and things and someone had actually said to me oh, I can't decide if I should marry you or someone else. And I was really shocked, you know, I didn't like this, this feeling. And on that, at that time in that seminar, I had an opportunity to say something to Shamataji. I really wanted to give this to her, you know, mother, you'll deal with this. And and I, I did, I said, we were in the car traveling, taking her to the station to Bristol and it went really quiet. And I thought this is my chance. And I just said, mother, so-and-so said this to me. I just didn't say anything. And she was very quiet. And then she said, you need someone who you can talk to. You know, it was so sweet. And that was it. I went, ah, you know, finished. But later on, oh, but you know, yeah, when did she say? Oh, so I don't know. Maybe that was on the way back from the station. I can't remember. But at the same time in this weekend, when there was some matching going on, she said, she suddenly said, oh, Felicity should marry so-and-so. And I was shocked, you know, and then I realized, oh, I have an idea about the kind of person I would marry and this person doesn't fit this, you know, in looks or, you know, things like that. But I really trusted mother. So I just said to myself, don't think about it. Just leave it. Don't think about it. Let it be, you know? And so I didn't. 
And then on the second or third morning, I woke up. And as I woke up, I suddenly had this image of being married to this person. And it wasn't all emotional roller coaster like you see in the Hollywood movies. It was just companionable and friendship and stable and solid. And I just went, oh, that's what marriage is supposed to be, you know? And it was such a lovely feeling. And, and I hadn't done anything. I just surrendered it to mother and let her yeah. show me, you know, I, I think I said, okay, show me, I don't understand. I said to myself, show me mother how this is a, you know, good match sort of thing. But then um, I'm sure that was just for me to work this particular thing out. And the gentleman declined quite understandably and so I went okay so there I was in India and mother suddenly so I'd gone completely lovely and I decided my only mother will know who will be good for me it's so lovely I don't have to think about this and then she <laughs> says put them down and I'm going oh no I don't want to do this you know but mother says so you have to so I had to sit there and there were about 12 men on the list and I had to think about each one and you know okay is that a good person to be matched to is that you know and I'm going I don't know you know you only see the outside of someone not the inside and and mother had said that in marriages the hard marriages she matches you vibrationally she made it very clear that those you know that she matches you vibrationally and it's not for happiness it's for your spiritual growth and joy so how can I know you know I can't know anyway so I went round all the men and I got to my husband Richard and I'd had a couple I had you know because it was a small tour we had everyone kind of knew everyone and I had some experiences in a coffee shop um you know chatting with him as part of a group and I had decided that <laughs> He didn't understand anything. I was very into deep emotional conversations, you know, and I could see he wasn't, you know, he didn't, I thought, oh, he doesn't get me at all. So I got to him and I went, oh, no way, you know, absolutely. Um, and I just, that was it. I just passed him over and went on. And so eventually after much difficulty, I put, to, I think I might've only come up with two names because all the rest just, just didn't feel like, you know, a good fit. And then I wrote, I would marry anyone that mother said, and I was willing to travel because some people weren't, you know, and I knew I had this feeling I was going to marry someone. I thought I'd end up in Australia because my mum is there, but I didn't. So, so then, um, so it's such a funny process. So we're back at camp. We're all, now we're all back at camp and we've heard that mother's in her bungalow and she's got these pieces of paper and that this matches. is the invite yeah, and that matching is going on and Richard my husband says you know he I wasn't so aware of this but every so often Warren who was the leader then of, of Australia he would arrive and come into the camp and he'd go up and be talking to someone you know and then he'd be talking to someone else then he'd disappear you know things like that I and I started to get very nervous and I just thought oh I'm not ready for this I'm not ready for this so the next time he came I went up to him and I said oh I'd like to take my name off the list I don't think I'm ready and he said oh actually mother's got someone for you you, you know what? she's got you a match um and it's Richard and I went Richard <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Richard <laughs> so so I, so I was a bit stunned you know um but it was nice because I hadn't thought about him at all like this it was very pure you know because I hadn't put my attention on it I just gone oh Richard nope you know and so that felt very nice and so I was still a bit concerned that this was a good match <laughs> and so the next time I saw him I said is mother happy with the match? And he said, oh yeah, she's very happy with the match. And later we heard, so I then said, that's fine, I accept. If mother's happy with the match, I'm happy, that's good. And later we heard that she'd said to Richard, if Felicity doesn't accept you, I have someone else in mind for you, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> um, it, 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 
so she, she really wanted him married and back to Canada, I think, with a couple. So sweet. And then I also heard later that she said, you know, I and she actually said this. <laughs> so when she was talking about each person in the circle, uh, when she asked, she said she did my friend Pam first. And she said, oh, Pam, Pam has such a big heart. You know, it's just beautiful, pure heart. And I thought, oh, I hope mother says that about me because I that's something that I wanted to have. And she got to me and she goes, she says, very weak left side. Very bad left side in front of it, you know. And I went, oh, I felt so like, oh, you know. And then she said, so sweet, sweet. And she goes, but not an aggressive bone in her body. You know, she was so sweet to sort of balance it like that. Anyway, I think Richard didn't Very didn't good. hear didn't hear anything of that for some reason. But I asked him later. He was always very cagey, but he said he put my so but he put me down. He put me down. And I said, Why? Why did you put me down? And I think he he just he was like, I don't know, he said something that when you arrived in the camp, you were very um he could feel, you know, I was so happy to see everyone and we were open, chat, open and yeah, I think so. Um anyway, so so we are engaged. And then mother said there were 12 couples, six rematches and six new matches. And Jamadaji said, um, two minutes. You're only allowed to talk two minutes a day, each of you. That's it. And it was wow. 10 days to the weddings. OK. And I could sort of feel she didn't want. people to talk too much and then their egos would some funny thing would come up so we weren't allowed to talk to each other but we could be together so I was standing in the um, dinner queue behind him we were just being together it was very nice because you can feel the vibration from the person you know so you start to get to know them vibrationally and um, without any words or anything and I could feel you know he had a very he had a good heart and he was, I could feel he was a kind person, you know, he was a kind person. And I'm standing in the queue behind him and suddenly I feel like mother say to me, you are two halves of a coin. Here's the tails, you are the heads or you are the heads, you know, you're two sides of the coin, two sides of the coin. And together you make the whole. And I felt oh. her say to me that you've had, you've come coming from very different places and you are very opposite people, but over time you will come into the center together and then you will be balanced and have, you know, a happy life. And that's, that's what happened, you know? And I yeah. went to, I went to Canada. I, we were there 35 years and it really healed me. And later I heard mother had said, I just had to get you out of England. You know, it was just, it was all too heavy for your left side. Yes. And, and it was, uh, yeah, it was a blessing. So, so then we had the weddings and we had um, the brides. I don't, I think Shumadaji did talk to us. I was very nervous. I don't, I was kind of a little bit in a haze, you know, vibrationally. And I really wanted to feel something special. And we had beautiful things. Uh, so we'll come to the photos in a minute. We did have, um, um, we had uh, headdresses and yep. the men, the men came on horses. Oh. They hired 12 horses for the grooms. So they were somewhere else. We were in Delhi. So at this point, we came to Delhi for the weddings. Oh, from Vedana to Delhi now. So yes. in 10 days, you had to talk two minutes, but you could be together. And then in that Delhi. condition or in, with that condition yes. applied, you traveled from Vedana to Delhi by train, I would believe, at that time? Uh, I don't, to be honest, I don't remember. It could have, oh, I'd have to think separately. Never Go. mind. <laughs> that's, 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 I don't I don't remember I just sort of oh when having said that so in Vaitana mother had a puja a puja and she had the most beautiful sari I finally found the photo but didn't have time to send it to you it was like a multicolored, like blue bright royal blue with red and gold and it was beautiful crown she had and she called us up um, the engaged couples to cut the newly engaged couples not the rematches I think yeah. to come up to her feet and we bowed at her feet and she did talk to us 
she did talk to us a little bit. And it, I always call that our engagement puja because it felt like that, you know. It was very special. And then we all left and went to Delhi and we were in Delhi. And we, so we, so the, we came out and you'll see the photos. We actually, do you want to show the photos? Cause then I can talk about the wedding I'm photos. Trying, sorry, I'm trying to make you a host, but would it be possible for you to show? Because there's a lot that is I not don't... opening. Oh, no. Um, why don't you pause? Okay, I will pause. Let's pause. The lady. Okay, let's, right. let's resume. <laughs> with... So I'll just uh, recap a little bit. Uh, we went to get the photos, so we haven't had a little pause. So, yes, thank you. so the ladies are in Delhi. Um, we were, um, we were sort of on this construction site where this block of flats was being built, but they could house all the yogis. So the yogis were all sleeping inside on mats in these empty um, concrete blocks without without I seem to remember there weren't windows anyway that's not important so the grooms they'd hired 12 horses for the grooms to come because a traditional Indian style is that the groom comes to the house yes. of the bride and these were the first collective yeah. weddings in Delhi and this Richard has some lovely stories about Look at him, look at him. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. See how yeah, they, they Yeah, that's him. And then they dressed up the horse and they, and they that's a whole regalia of the yeah, yeah. party. Yeah. And, uh, and I think they ran out. I think they only had eleven. They couldn't find a twelve. So I can't remember <laughs> what he said, whether somebody had to go on foot or not. But so they arrive, they come to the venue on these horses, so beautiful. And then we could show the photos of the garland and um, we, so it was all very new. I had, I had some experience of um, the weddings in England. We'd had collective weddings in England. I don't think yeah. vows, vows had been spoken at all. And so this was, this was in India. So these were the first collective weddings in India. And we shared one one fire, and here we are standing ready to garland. And you can see that I've got. Uh, we've all we were given these beautiful. Mother had bought them these beautiful like veils um, with yeah. a white silk and gold gold edging that were so lovely. Very unusual. Yeah, it's the first time I'm seeing a bridal attire. With yes, that because because we so the men had crowns I don't think I, mother's picture was in them at this point as I said this was like the sort of the first time that they were doing it like this so first time for the Indians to arrange a collective wedding and that's me on this end on the left hand side okay. in this beautiful sorry yes that happens to be me and uh, I was the shortest I think I don't know why I was there anyway and then if we move on to the Amazing. next photo So is that the one? Well, there was another one. There was another one. Yeah, go back a bit. Yeah, it must be before. It's before the the garden. The other one. Yeah. yeah. I guess. So, so it was a very a special ceremony. There was an Indian like pujari, and Shumataji was. They were kind. It felt like she was making up the vows on the moment, and he would say something in sanskrit and then and then she would give this indian this uh english this vow and i remember as each one was announced thinking oh i'd like to vow that yes i'd like to vow that because you know this was the first time we'd not seen vows and they were about um sharing the finances you know the husband giving the money to the wife uh welcoming um welcoming sajogis to your house and i think there was about like half a dozen eight very nice and later then they in other ceremonies and following years they be they refined and adjusted a little bit and used those those vows so it was very sort of groundbreaking and then we just had one fire 
that we all walked around together. And I do remember, I think we might have had individual little rice things that we, um, you know, nudged yes. with our with our foot. But there was essentially just the one fire that we were all walking around. So yes, there they are. Gosh, she looks so young. So, so, so special how you nudge the little mounds of rice with the toe and on the toe that is the nabi chakra and it's the lakshmi doing it the guru lakshmi it's just dawned on me when you're telling me this so much oh my lord that is so amazing so beautiful so and this special is, this here on the right is my beloved friend and sister pamela bromley who got married to a very sweet um, Swiss man at the time, but Pamela has since passed away. Um, but she, she will. I will talk about the sari in a minute. It was very beautiful, and and then we'll pass on to the next one, which yeah. is afterwards. So this is after the wedding ceremony, and then we were taken into. I think it was in the similar place to where we'd been garlanding. They'd set up um, like double bench seats like you know how you can have a, a bench seat that two people sit on so they'd set yes. these up for us to for each couple to sit on and that's what we're doing oh. we're sitting there and we're yes. a little bit raised up everyone was raised up and then all the guests if you like the yogis yes. they came gave it gave us gifts and we had gifts from um, from Pune, gifts from Mumbai, we were given like beautiful, like practical things like rush mats for table settings. And then Shumataji came by and gave each bride a necklace and the grooms, I think, got rings, um, you, you know, which was unexpected. And I look a bit blissed out, I must say. <laughs> and then we had our food. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, in a different realm, isn't it? Yeah. So gorgeous. Beautiful. It's true. Because, and and afterwards, and then I should say, Shumataji booked hotel rooms for all the couples. So, right. Oh. <laughs> so, so we all got um, a, a hotel room for the night, I think, so that we actually could get to know each other. And then in the morning, we had breakfast together. And then he left. No, I was due to leave with very soon. Um, so there you are, you know, married to somebody that you don't know because <laughs> we'd only been allowed to speak two minutes a day. Um, and I remember yeah. the, the night of the marriage, he started sharing all these nice things about his family and his friends and, you know, Vancouver. I mean, there was never any doubt that I wasn't going to go to Vancouver. I was very excited about that. And I remember before we went to the hotel, where we were on the puja site i just i remember feeling surrounded by love i felt like this is what it means to be in love there is just love because everybody was coming up and congratulating us and it was the most blissful experience you just i thought this is it we you could almost physically feel it this this love in the air it had you know we're so used to be having being able to have to touch everything you know you have to something to be real you have to touch it with your fingers or your hands and on this India tour and after realization mother took us into realms of the spirit where you feel things that you couldn't have imagined mm -hmm. feeling you know beyond your comprehension as a human being and after the weddings it was like that it was like I was just in this realm of love in this divine um divine divine love and it was such a you know wow. such a beautiful experience and and these things that we touched you know on india tour and and even recently here in pujas here and i feel it's like this is what's waiting for us this is there this realm of the spirit that is up above our agia so beyond beyond our thoughts beyond what we can imagine and when you saw these humble, simple people in India who don't, didn't have, you know, in the villages, they don't have all these mental processes that we have. Their life isn't, isn't um, led by, you know, now I do this, now I do that. It's much more sort of free flowing, instinctual. And then you can go through your heart into the realm of the spirit. And it's this beautiful place that mother has 
there. It's there for us if we can surrender and desire it. The deepest experiences I've had in Sad Yoga is when I desired to feel something. It doesn't happen like that, you know. Sometimes you have this desire and then when you're least expecting it, mother just plops it into you. But we should never stop desiring the yeah. best, you know, the, the finest. So anyway, I wanted to share a little bit the story of the sari. So you can sorry. see in that yeah. photo. Now this is, so this, my poor sari is what, 40 years. This is, when did we get married? 82. So yeah, it's 41 years later. So I don't know if it still has the same vibrancy, but this, it's silver thread. And you can see on the back of it, how much, when you look at the back side, see, how this is the back side. Been done. Yeah, yeah, this is the back side, all the silver thread. And so I have to say that this was a sari that Shumataji chose for me. And the story of it is so mm. sweet. I'm going, to, I'm going to put it like this so you can see it as I'm yes, talking. Yes, please, yes. <laughs> Oh, it's lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's keep it there. Beautiful, so, gorgeous is not the word. Yeah, it's all the colors. I call it my rainbow sari. It's all the colors yeah. of the world. So, so before the weddings, um, it could have been the day before, I don't remember. We heard that uh, someone had come from the town with wedding saris and they were all being laid out downstairs on a table and the brides should come down and choose a sari, choose the sari they would like. And so we were down there on the at the tables and I'm looking at all these colours of the saris and my sort of instinct was drawing me towards pink kind of light soft colours. And part of me is saying to myself, oh, but Flisty, this feels a little bit left-sided. Maybe you should have something a bit different, you know? And there were lots mm -hmm. of uh, wedding color, red saris and green saris. My friend Pam picked up this sari. Yeah. She said, oh, Felicity, look at this sari. Isn't this wonderful? Look at the colors. Oh, I want this sari. And what do you think? She said, what do you think? And I said, it's a bit loud, Pam. <laughs> That's what I said to her. <laughs> I said, it seems a bit loud, you know, like it's really in your face kind of sorry. And she goes, oh, yes, but I just love it, you know. So then mother came down and she asked all the brides to bring up their choice one by one in front of her. So Pam was in front of me. And so she comes up with this sari that she loves. And mother goes, no, not this sari. Takes it from Pam and puts it down and then picks up a more traditional red green one, you know, and gives it to Pam. And then I come up with my pink one, sort of feeling, you know, I know this isn't quite the right sari. And mother goes, no, 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 not that one. Puts it down. And then she picks up Pam's sari. She picks this up and she goes, here, you should have this sari. And then she looks at me and she says, do you like it? And I said, yes, mother, knowing she knew exactly what I've been feeling, you know. And so I, so I, remember, I remember Pam feeling a bit wistful that I'd got the sari that she wanted, you know. But it was amazing wow. because it was such a, a completely different sari. And it was like wearing a new skin. There was no color. You know, if I'd worn the pink or something, it somehow that color gave me a, a feeling, you know, like the pink one was a bit more sort of, you know, I don't know, for me at that time, a bit more in the left, left side encouraging. The red okay. ones were a bit more like, you know, but this was, there was nothing with this. Perfect. So it was like wearing a completely new skin and it was so beautiful. And then I came back from, um, I came back from India and Shumaraji said to me, now you fly like a bird. She said, you, you leave here, get, get, get to Canada as soon as you can and fly like a bird. And within three weeks, we had the bans for marriage published. Wow. We had a registry marriage in Chelsea, Chelsea Town Hall. Uh, we had uh, Easter Puja, Chelsea Road, and we left. And that was it, you know, off we went to a new life. And she invited us before, she said, come see me before you go to Canada. And so we went mm -hmm. to her house in Brompton Square. We went in and, and, and later we'll talk more about, you know, how beautiful it was at Brompton Square. So Richard and I, we were squashed into her living room. I say squashed because 
there was a lot of very ornate, beautiful furniture, like a sofa, like chaise lounge, all with wooden carvings and you know embroidery sort of style covers, and a coffee table, a glass coffee table, and she gestured to us to sit on the chairs. I couldn't. I, I tried, and I felt so uncomfortable, you know, because I'm so used to sitting at mother's feet. And after a while, I just yeah. couldn't do it. And I so I squashed myself on the floor between the chair and and the coffee table, and then I felt relaxed. And she talked to us about going to Canada, and establishing Sajoga there because she had been in the October before she had done the public program, and after she had left, she'd sent an Australian in November, so October 81, this had been before the tour. And the Australian had moved into the ashram with my husband and his two friends into their collective house, which I guess became an ashram, you know. And she quietly was giving programs and gave each one of them realization. And six weeks oh. later, they came on the India tour. And three months after getting realization, Richard got married. And we went wow. to camp and they were all so new. He didn't even know about foot, really about foot soaking. They hadn't really done foot soaking and things. So it was so wow. new and fresh in Canada. And she said to us, she said, Canada is um, more like England than America. And she said, go and be dynamic. And she praised, spoke very highly of Pierre Trudeau, who was prime yes. minister. And I've, I've shared those stories uh, another time, but... Um, yeah. Yes. So that was it. That was okay. a beginning. It's a fabulous sorry. Fantastic colours and they really complement. I mean oh, who look, can do I'm showing you the inside, the back side. This is the front side. I should yeah. be having the front side up. Yeah. I know. So what a journey. What a journey from and now here we are. Yeah. So thank you for oh, having me today. Beautiful. Thank I, you so I, much for joining us. I hope some of the things, I feel like I want to end with a, a special, yes, I guess, you know, for people who what feel. What would your sort of advice be for the, for the future generations, let's say, for, for the people who come after well, what the I younger wanted, ones? What I wanted to say where really was that for those who feel they missed out, that they didn't, weren't with Srimataji physically, you mustn't feel like that. Yes, it, of course it was different, but I would like now to be with mother in her physical presence as I am now, because I, it, in those days, we couldn't experience and feel the immensity of her being in the same way that we can now. Now we have so many yogis, the world has changed so globally and each one of us still has her personal attention on us. If we just ask for it and open ourselves. And I just talk to, I talk to Shumataji, you know, I talk to her. I, I have to say um, to my, you know, not good thing. When mother passed away, I was so upset because I was expecting that I would know beforehand that I would somehow be able to take my leave or say goodbye in some way. Instead, I came home from work, from teaching, and walked into the house and my husband and son said, oh, mother's died, mother's passed away. And I didn't believe it. I thought they, they were joking. It took me so much by surprise because we were in Vancouver in Canada. So we hadn't heard any of the news or had an understanding as they had in Europe that that something was changing. And I went upstairs in front of my altar and I burst into tears. And I just said, I'm so angry with you, mother, that you've gone. And, you know, and I, I, I'm not ready for you to go. And I felt her say to me, I had to leave so that you would become ready. You, you need, you know, you have to grow into that person I want you to be. You have to let me go, you know, my physical form, in my physical form. Yeah. But mother, but you know, this is, this is God. Before I even met Shumatachi, the sense of, of there being God, God was there, was so deep in me. And meeting mother in her, human form it was like the marrying of that belief that desire that understanding of the design divine 
made manifest in mother's human form, but she was limited in her human form, in her physical being, and she needed to let go of that body so that she could be everywhere all at once at the time. And she said to me, the, the, the best advice I would give is just meditate. Any problems you have, you know, I mean, that's what she said to me when I once when I she said, how are you? And I said, oh, such and such. She said, meditate more. And I, I realized that, I mean, we need to, we live normal lives as householders, as yogis, as all people in the world. We all face challenges and and they make us grow. But when we face a challenge and we, it's not fun at the time, it can be very painful and confusing, but we work through it and you come out the other side and something has changed fundamentally inside us. Something changes and we become free of it. And if we can accept, and it's so easy to say and hard to do, but if we can accept the challenges, ask for mother's help to help us through them, that we understand ourselves. I would say many years ago, I was first in Canada, mother said to me, despite all your problems, Felicity, you have always been sincere and honest. And I felt the way mother said that these were qualities that she really were important because you have to be honest with yourself. And sometimes it's hard, you think, you know, you go, really? Am I really like that? Or is it really not that person? It's really my reaction to that person. And, and I have to, you know, look to that. And I would say I've really come to understand that, that you cannot change the behavior of other people. And in some ways, I mean, sometimes you can ask that they could get dry but in general you you can't it's between them and shamataji it's them and the divine but we can change our own behavior we can change how we react to things we can change how we see things so these days i try very hard well it's not so difficult these days it is not so difficult to feel positive about things to feel in a good space and to, I'm older now, I'm more detached from what goes on outside. I say, you know, this is mother, this is your work. I do my bit. And, and I think I would repeat what she says, enjoy yourself. Because when you enjoy yourself, you are relaxed, the vibrations flow, mother can work through you, and she can, she can fix anything. But we have to be patient, patient with ourselves, and, but we're here to enjoy this life. And at this point in a Sajogi's life, there is so much to enjoy in it. So let's focus on that, enjoy what we have around us. And I was so busy with, we, had, we did have five children in the end, much to my surprise. I was very busy. And very good example. Yeah. And at one very, point, very good. destiny. Take, we had twins at the end, so we mother got her five children in with her. <laughs> and but at one, I remember as a mother, busy mother, and I felt like I don't have time to meditate properly. I used to put the TV on for the twins for half an hour so I could foot soak. You know, and think, it's okay. I need to foot soak. <laughs> I will go nuts if I don't. You know. And, but I couldn't put any attention other than outside of my short meditation at night and my, you know, when I did a little bit in the morning. And at one point I was feeling like, oh, you know, I'm not putting enough time in and, and thought, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just so busy. And then after a, a while, weeks or some months, I realized I had changed anyway, that I had put the time into a little bit of time, you know, keep the connection as much as you can with the meditations, foot soak meditation. But my attention is there, mother is with me, my desire is there, and my daily life had also changed me. You know, it's not just about meditation. It's all about living your daily life and through your daily life, mother gives you experiences, challenges, different things. 
I think we're in a really special time. And I'm so blessed to be with all these wonderful yogis we have. And it gives me so much joy to see that first, second, third generation of children grown up, married, with so many grandparents. When I had my first grandchild, I just felt, wow, this is it, mother. You've done it, you know, you've done it. You've got these generations and that's it. She does it all and she, yes, we are her instruments, but it's amazing time. We're on, hang on for the ride. We're on for good times, more good times ahead. Yeah. So thank you for having me. I hope, I know I spoke a lot. I hope some of it will That's be. That's the idea. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> I hope some of it will be useful and meaningful. And just from my heart to you and anyone who is watching, um, know that you are loved. That's what mother said to me one time. Can you not feel how much I love you? That's what she said. Can you not feel? how much I love you. She loves each one of us like that. Thank you, Master Jade. Thank you ever so much. And we'll meet again soon for the uh, Open Your Heart uh, seminar. Okay, thank you for the session. Jai Shri Mataji. And thank Jai you, Master for everything. Jai Shri Mataji. Jai Shri Mataji.